He told me, hey, I got something fantastic to tell you. He said, I am affiliated with people that speak with the spirits of the dead. How would you like to talk to this, the, the spirit of your dead mother? And I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. He said, you wouldn't be uh, afraid of talking to, to the spirit of your dead mother, would you? Well, I said, I'll tell you what, I would have to give that some thought because it's something I never thought about before in my life. Heart Research Center presents A Trip into the Supernatural with best-selling author Roger Morneau. While still a young man in the city of Montreal, Roger Morneau became involved in the worship of demons. In this two-part series, Roger gives us a first-hand account of his harrowing brush with the powers of darkness and ultimately his divine rescue. Also joining him are Cyril and Cynthia Grossi, the very couple who first pointed Roger from the darkness to the light. Conducting this exclusive interview are Dan and Karen Houghton of Heart Research Center. Let's now join the Houghtons and Roger Morneau as we together enter part one of A Trip into the Supernatural. How in the world did you ever get involved in praying to demon spirits? Well, when I came out of the uh, Navy after World War II, I um, was looking for to take up a trade in Montreal, Canada. And at that time, I ran across uh, a fellow that had been on a particular ship with me. And he said, hey, Mono, you're alive. How nice to meet you. He says, let's have a dinner tonight. I said to my boss, can I have the evening off? Because I was uh, the assistant to the Windsor Bowling Alleys and uh, uh, Billiard, you know. It's the high-class uh, place in Montreal where all the dress manufacturing, manufacturing people go and uh, relax. <clears throat> so I got the evening off and I went out, uh, we went out and had dinner. He told me, hey, I got something fantastic to tell you. He said, I am affiliated with people that speak with the spirits of the dead. How would you like to talk to this, the, the spirit of your dead mother? And I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. He said, you wouldn't be uh, afraid of talking to, to the spirit of your dead mother, would you? Well, I said, I'll tell you what, I would have to give that some thought because it's something I never thought about before in my life. Most of us probably haven't, a little afraid of something like that. Well, he says, you know, you know, it's written all over your face. You're afraid of, of going to a seance. But he says, I know you, he says, you're going to come. And uh, then he started to tell me how brave I was when I was aboard ship, you know, <laughs> different things. He says, you're not the same man, you're changed. You're, you're chicken. That's all I needed to hear. I said, when do we go to a seance. So one Saturday evening, we were in the place. It was the very first time, very beautiful place, the medium, it was a lady. She had a gorgeous new home in Montreal. And there were about 20 uh, invited guests there, which I was one of them. And uh, she communicated with the spirits for uh, different people there and give, telling them what the spirit said. And then there was one lady that had been talking almost continually before the, the seance started, and she didn't believe in the, the you know, the dead appearing and all of this and all that. And she said, well, I would have to see my dead sister, she says, to believe it. So <laughs> while this, uh, the seance was, was going, one man that, uh, <clears throat> said, I would like to talk to my friend that died six months ago, but I don't want him to appear. Just want to talk to him. Because he says, I don't trust you talking to my, my friend for me. So the, so the uh, medium says, let me inquire of the spirit. Yeah, the spirit will, will talk with you. And that big masculine voice was heard in the place. He says, hi, Frank. It's nice of you to ask for me to talk with you. And they had a little chat. And after it was over, Frank says, this is the greatest thing honored 
to be able to talk with the spirits of the dead. Then this, the medium said, we have a very special surprise tonight for you people. A spirit will manifest itself openly here in a few minutes. And it's like, it's like a big gust of wind hit the building and right through the wall. <laughs> now the, the lights weren't uh, terribly bright, but they, you know, they were like living room lights. Uh, a couple of floor lamps and maybe some of these. And that uh, translucent being seemed to come right out of the wall. How did you feel right at that moment? It's almost like my heart stopped a little bit. Okay. You know, very weird feeling. So it was a lady in a beautiful evening gown, swirling. And she said to, to Mary, my dear sister, you are so wonderful to have asked for me. And Mary fainted and fell right off her chair on the floor. <laughs> and a couple of guys jumped up and picked her up and uh, spread gone. And that was the beginning of it. That's how you got into it. Yeah, that's the way I got into it. After a while, you see, <clears throat> There's something interesting about the, the human uh, mind. You can adjust an awful lot of stuff. You can adjust to a lot of things that, you, that would terrify you to begin with. After a while, they become common and ordinary. Hmm. So you mean contact with the supernatural can become commonplace and ordinary and doesn't bother anybody? Yeah. In other words, the more that you do it, you're not uncomfortable. That's it's right. It's just not yeah. an uneasy feeling. Yeah. So but how then, did you feel about it? Then I got that? into a secret society that worshipped the spirits, you see. Well, how did, okay, different. now, how, how is that different from the seance, Roger? It happens that uh, <clears throat> the seance um, are not involving in many ways. But when you get into a secret society of spirit worshippers, then, and especially when you're invited there by the direction of the higher-ups in the spirit world, you never get out of there alive. And this is exactly what my friend and I were up against. We didn't know anything about it. And uh, there was a very, very popular uh, uh, big band leader. A jazz jazz, jazz musician. band. Yeah. Very famous. He played a lot in Montreal, Canada, Vancouver, the big cities. And uh, one night we went to uh, one of these uh, seances, and uh, he was with his wife. Now the spirits had told him what to do. The spirit told him, there's two of these guys, give the names, and your wife will want to talk, uh, will make it so that your wife will want to talk to the, to the medium when you say that you want to go home because you're tired. As soon as you see that these guys are starting to, to, to want to leave, then leave with them at the same time, and as you get outdoors, you ask them if they're driving. They'll say, no, they're going to take the tramway a couple blocks away. Well, he's, you invite them to get in your car with you, with you and that you will take them to a fancy restaurant and, and treat them to some good food and uh, to talk about the Merchant Navy. And that's what they did, the guy uh, did. And there we were in this, uh, well, this plush restaurant pulled into a little alley, and I can still see it like it was yesterday. <laughs> just enough room to pass the car, the back alley, that happened to give on a, re a restaurant that was on St. Catherine's uh, Street, which is the main street of Montreal. And um, that was quite an evening. So, Roger, you're at this restaurant. What happened? Well, after we were seated, <clears throat> in entering there, the place was just full, packed tight. But there was a couple of tables against a wall that was had a reservation sign on it. And the uh, owner of the place recognized the band leader and came and said, good evening, and uh, you gentlemen want a table. So you're one of the reserve people. So we sat there, and uh, we had our favorite alcoholic beverages, you know. Uh, and uh, as we talk, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the band leader says, how long have you fellas been involved with sorcery? <laughs> and he chalked us a little bit, and I said, exactly what do you mean? Well, he said, you know, what you people are doing, talking to 
the supposed spirits of the dead. He says, this is, this is, this is silly. And this man had been at the seance with you. Yeah, oh yeah. And he's telling you that it's silly what you've yeah. just done. Because see, my wife, he says, goes to these seances because she gets comfort and she gets uh, something good out of it, good feeling out of it. And she lives for what the spirits uh, you know, are going to see that the future is going to be like. To me, he says, I can't bother with this stuff. He says, I want power. I go right to the source of power. And he says, how do you think that I became famous the way that I am? Well, I said, you must have had some good luck. Well, he says, there's no such thing as good luck. He says, there's either some power working for you somewhere, or you don't get ahead in this world. Not in my, my type of occupation. So um, it, it went from there. We, went, we got talking about uh, spirit worship. Did it intrigue you? Or did it make you want to find out more about what exactly he was talking about? Yeah. So he said the, the supposed spirits of the dead that you're talking with are demon spirits. You're fallen angels. You're beautiful beings. Just set it out, just like oh, that. Oh, yeah. It didn't make you uneasy when he said they were Well, you know, it shocked you a little bit, you know. Something that you first hear uh, uh, mentioned to you. He said, uh, you guys have got a great future ahead of you. Because we've been told, the high priest of our society, secret society, has been told that the master has very special plans for you too. Now, what did he mean by the master? Uh, Satan. And uh, we were interested to hear more about it. And he told us, he says, look, we worship spirits. We worship Lucifer, the f Lucifer and all his angels. They're just as beautiful as they did they before they were cast out of heaven. He says there was a misunderstanding in the whole thing, he says, the, among the inhabitants of the galaxies. And he says our master was misunderstood and God did not bear with him like he does with, with people that make mistakes today. So we're in a warfare, good against evil. And we happen to be the evil ones, but we're not that bad. He says, I look at this business between the forces of good and evil. He says, you believe in, in uh, one person believe in God, and the other one believe in Lucifer. It's like politics. Hmm. So the great controversy mm -hmm. is real. And you've oh, yeah. heard someone talk about it that's on the other side. Mm -hmm. And to these people, <clears throat> they are sold to the fact that uh, Christ will not return to this planet with power and great glory. He's going to abdicate all claims to the planet because this, the high priest once said that uh, Christ will abdicate all claims to the planet because he knows that it is lawfully and rightfully Satan's. And at, and at that time he says, Luc uh, Lucifer, you, you, uh, you mentioned Lucifer a lot of times, but he mentioned Satan also. He says, the master, usually they, they like to talk about the master. The master will resurrect his people from the graves. Now, George is telling you all this, or the high priest? George. George. Okay, when the evening yeah. wound down, and you're putting a cap on all that, mm -hmm. you guys had consumed some alcohol. Yeah. And you, did you feel like that there was kind of a one-shot deal? You didn't know if it ever happened again? What happened after well, that? Well, he said, no, I said, listen, guys. He said, I, I like to have you, he says, uh, meet some of our people. But about next week, Wednesday evening, I'll pick you up at uh, your place and uh, you're invited to uh, one of our uh, services. Services? Yeah. Like a church service? Yeah, something similar to like that. It's a testimonial to the spirits, well, how the spirits have blessed your life. So, uh, when we left there, I said to myself, this guy is half drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to hear from him again, you know. But uh, it, it was true. That, uh, Wednesday night came, he was there with his big Lincoln, step in, and we went to one of the uh, most beautiful areas of Montreal. Um, and uh, the place was a mansion. Now, a mansion is usually very large. We'll, we call this a little a small mansion. It was beautiful, most beautiful place. Yeah. Roger, 
your friend George took you and Roland to this mansion where people worshipped the demons. Mm -hmm. What was it like there? What kind of people were there? Well, it was a big surprise for me as I kind of made up my mind an idea that they were going to be rough looking characters. But as we entered the place, I was amazed to see that they were all very well dressed, well mannered, and that a lot of the people, as we were in being introduced to people, were professionals, doctors, attorneys, uh, a lot of business people. And see what they had, they had a praise session to the gods, which is the uh, spirit counselors, which are in charge of legions of, of spirits, yeah. of demon spirits. And uh, they talk about what the, the Lord of their lives has done for them. Because they call on particular spirits, uh, like uh, um, the god Nehoshta, which you read in Second King about the Israelites uh, worship the golden serpent that Moses had made. Mm -hmm. Well, behind behind the spirit worship, they, behind that they were worshiping the serpent. They were actually worshiping uh, this uh, spirit Nehoshta, and the same spirit Nehoshta is. The priest was telling us that the medical doctor that was telling us how he was making operations that had never been made before because people had to be awake, yet have no have no no feeling. He was able to, uh, you know, carry on the surgeries that had not been done before. Mm -hmm. But the spirits would give that capacity to be able to uh, operate without people feeling uh, any pain and things, and also without uh, no problem with the, with the blood because as he would cut his incision because incisions. Everything opened and with no blood running. Mm -hmm. So you could do the work that has not been done before. So. Now I recall reading in your book that at this um, praise worship service they had, they would sing hymns. Why would they sing hymns in a demon worship? Yeah, um, this was kind of a big surprise to me when, I, when that took place. The priest said, hey, let's go down to the worship room of the gods and uh, have a praise session, you know, a singing session. So we go down there, and what did they think? You think did they pass around church hymnals, you know, Christian church hymnals? And I couldn't believe this. I said, "What's his business?" So the priest says, "Well, now he says for those of you that are new, <laughs> let me tell you that this is the most feasible way." He says to please the spirits, it's to deride Christ and His people, you know, and His church and all that. So they sing. Uh, uh, out of Christian uh, hymnals, they didn't sing Christian words to the hymns. However, well, they change. They change a lot of the, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so not for it's the a good. form of it's a form of blasphemy. Yeah. Mm. Such as you see today, in the rock music world, you see the, the entertainers. They have these crosses. Mm -hmm. Ladies got earrings, crosses. Mm -hmm. The guys got the cross. This is a form of blasphemy, a, a, a form of deriding Christ. You see. Spirits uh, cause the people to do that, to find pleasure in wearing this type of uh, uh, emblem, which is the, the cross is the emblem of the crucifixion of Christ huh? to the Christians. Mm -hmm. So what were your impressions the first time you went down into that worship room? Well, it was, uh, we'd been there maybe a half a dozen times, and uh, the high priest uh, told us after the meeting was over, he wanted to talk to us my friend and I. So after the uh, most people had left, he says, uh, the master of my life has revealed to me that it is time for you people to become acquainted with the worship room of the gods. Well, we started to move <coughs> toward a beautiful uh, um, grand staircase. Beautiful. The banister was, was huge. It was massive. And the Iron, uh, wrought iron work that they had done in it was a super. The beautiful decorations on the walls, the chandelier on the first landing. See, that was the first landing. About you go down about eight or ten steps, and then you had the first landing. It was huge and beautiful. The the light arrangement was the nicest I had ever seen in my life. When we got into this this uh, sanctuary area, it wasn't very brightly lit, but everything was. Uh, well, magnified uh, the beauty of uh, certain things. Uh, you know, like uh, 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 a lot of the things were gold-plated. 
or gold trims. You see, the little altars where they had they had the, the spirits that had materialized. They took, uh, they photographed them, and then they had paintings made of them. And there was a, probably about maybe a hundred of those around the place. Sort of like a shrine. Yeah, and underneath there was a little altar where you have an incense and uh, things that they would use in their in their prayer sessions and things like that, devotions to, to certain spirits. And uh, some of the objects in there, the priest said, were solid gold. Mm. It was it was a unique experience to see that. So how did you feel when you walked into that room? I um, felt that uh, these people had power, and they had a lot of it. Did that attract you? Uh, yes and no. You had mixed feelings about it. I had it. mixed feelings about it, yeah. Because to a certain extent, things looked so good and sounded so good to us. But you see, I'd been brought up in a Christian home where my parents had told us we were eight children in the family. And especially the, the older ones, you know. Uh, my dad says, well, you know, if you get involved in wrongdoing, you're going to have to pay the price. There's always a cost for everything in this world. So this thought kept creeping to my mind. Just how far you go with these spirits before we start paying the price. See? So it made you just a little bit nervous. Oh, yes. But yet you kept going back. Oh, there was no way out. Because that's what we were told. You knew at that time. Yeah. So you were moving forward more on fear. More on fear, yes. Because the, the high priest said that the, the master had special plans for us in our lives. And that no one ever went into the society unless they were invited by the spirits. See, so that was made very clear. And he also expressed to us the danger, explained to us the danger of uh, uh, going against the will of the spirits. And he mentioned about this one uh, man and his wife that live in a fireproof building in Montreal. The place burned right down with a minute. Mm. He was one of their members that had decided that, well, he wanted to think things over. He, he was not going to get initiated at a time that the spread had said he would like him to be initiated in the, into the society. So in reality, Roger, you were chosen mm -hmm. by high-powered demon spirits. Yeah to be a part of their human, special, privileged mm -hmm. group. You see, these people in Montreal, the society, uh, like the priest mentioned, there's thousands of spirit worshippers, you know, in different societies of spirit worshippers in this world. But he says, we are the elite. We know the real truth about the master and his angels. And they're not idiot looking beings. They are gorgeous creatures. And from the paintings that they had on the, on, that, in, on the wall of the walls of that worship room, they were unique be beings. Especially the, there was a painting full, f uh, you know, full, full size, length. full length uh, painting of, of uh, the fallen Lucifer above his altar. And that was very fascinating because he looked like a man of great intellect, high forehead, the way that he looked with his eyes, the way he had the eyes looking. It uh, gave you a depth of perception of somebody that is very, very knowledgeable and powerful. And, power, and powerful, yeah. So, Roger, this high priest that you talked about, he is the one that ushered you down into the worship room. Mm -hmm. Was he also the one that led out in the praise sessions that you talked about? Yes, and he had an assistant also, another priest. Okay. Now, when you would go to these praise sessions, mm -hmm. what kinds of things happened? At those at those sessions, well, there's a lot of uh, success stories, positive so, mental attitude kinds of things. Well, yes, a lot of success stories. Uh, the the masters has done this for me and not for me. I remember one uh, lumber dealer. He had like half a dozen different operations around the Quebec, and uh, everything that he touched seemed to turn to money. And he was telling about it. And then there's uh, this other person that was a clairvoyant that uh, would work only for the wealthy people, only for the super wealthy. He says, I have the know-how, 
they have the means, let them pay. So he advised in, in business transactions. He would come to him and say, listen, I, I look at this deal that I might get, you know, this factory or whatever it is, because this guy was, this person was interested in industrial real estate, see. And he would talk to the spirit and then he would, the spirit was audible to him. See, you could hear the spirit talk to him, but the, the, the man did not hear. So the spirit was telling him what, was telling the, the uh, clairvoyant what, uh, well, he called himself an astrologer, reading the moons and the stars and, you know. Now, what the was sun. the term you used for his title, this man? Clairvoyant. Clairvoyant. Oh, clairvoyant. Mm -hmm. Clairvoyant. Okay. Yes, and uh, it was interesting. This person uh, stood up and says, hey, I had a nice little experience last week. And he says, the masters, he says, they take care of you. This lady and her husband brought him uh, to this astrologer a bundle of money. They said, this is the deal that you... And he works at, uh, only on percentages. Only on percentages. He does, he does work for set amounts of money. Only percentages of what the people are going to make. So he said, they brought me a substantial amount of money. And they were very happy with it, and I thought, thought it was very reasonable. But then my guide, Spirit, says, ask them when they're going to give you the other $1,700 that is really yours. And he says to the folks, I would like to know now before we leave here, when will you have the $1,700 to give me that makes up my part of, you know, rightful part of, of, of the, uh, the, the deal. The wife fainted, <laughs> and uh, the husband says, we'll have the money for you within 24 hours. So that was this type of priest. So he was thanking the demons for helping him to know that. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. demon spirits. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. At what point did this demon worship start to affect you personally, Roger? Well, <clears throat> it wasn't too long that the priest mentioned to us that uh, the time had arrived for us to start trusting the spirits and give the spirits a chance to work for us. And there was a number of gifts that you could choose from, you see. And um, I used to play the horses, some, non, not knowledgeable at all. I used to go to those bookies, you know, play the horses so often. But I said, hey, I would like to, to, to be able to, for the Spirit to, to instruct me on the, the numbers and the name of the horses that's going to win, you know, at Belmont or... Uh, some other uh, racetracks like that, <clears throat> make myself a little money. So the priest says, it'll be, it'll be given you. And sure enough, one night, I, I, well, I fell into a trance or, or dreamed the thing. I don't know exactly what happened, but I, I saw three races that were really going to pay big. And these horses were, were dummies, so to speak, you know what I mean? They were not really good horses. They were like the, one, one ho horse paid 21 to 1 because he was that poor, right? The chance of winning was so poor that he paid 21 to 1 on him. And it showed me that I saw the, the, the board, at the bouquet, and the number on it. And I went there and uh, they said it was going to be on Saturday. Uh, that was like on Wednesday, a few days later, it was Saturday. I went there, and sure enough, there they were on the boards. I went to uh, uh, the wicket and uh, handed some money and, and uh, uh, got myself uh, a winner. Now I said, well, I'm, I'm a little crazy. I ought to put more money on there, so I, I, I put $20 onto the next horse, and that paid 21 to 1. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I left there with maybe four or $500 in my, in my hands. And uh, I started to do that. In, in, this, in this case, I went directly down to the finest men's shop on St. Catherine Street and bought myself a $200 suit. <laughs> and in 1946, a $200 suit was... Uh, in 1946, was... people uh, used to work at the RCA Victor, where I had worked before I went to the Navy for $18 a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good earners were 75 to 50 to $75 per week, uh, you know, for... Uh, Labor. So the, the demon spirits looked on you so favorably, they began oh, yeah. to help you win mm -hmm. in your gambling. Then I went to other bookies, you see. 
And one day, I uh, am told of the man at the cage, where you do your bet, he says, my boss would like to talk to you. And he said, you go right through that door over there. Oh, sure. So I know the guy says, come on in. The guy's sitting behind a big desk, smoking the big cigar. So he says, you're uh, Roger. I says, yeah. He got up and walked around me. He said, you don't look that smart. I said, what, sir? You don't look that smart. He said that you could pick horses that are winners when they're supposed to be losers. Where do you get your help? What do you mean help? I'm not getting any help. I just happened to go and... Oh, no. We've been watching you here, he says, for a number of weeks. And you always leave here with some of our good money. And I'll tell you, buddy, if you want a list of the, all the bookies in Montreal, I'll give you a list of them. But he says, I want you out of here. And don't show up again. Because somebody's going to put a... You know, what I, you know what I mean? I said, okay, sir, I won't be back again. It's a tough business to be in uh, gambling. <laughs> so, <laughs> so even with the uh, spirit's help, it was tough. Yeah. Well, it's stuff he's going to shoot you, yes. <laughs> yeah. The high priest would say a number of things to you when you were in these praise services, and you went to a number of them over oh, a period yeah. of time. Mm -hmm. Talked about the issues of the great conflict. You've already touched oh, on yeah. that a little mm -hmm. bit. I want you to follow up on that a little bit more, Roger. Um, some of the things that you wrote in your book, Trip into the Supernatural, sounds a whole lot like what we as Christians today know as the great controversy. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that, that he told you there? Well, he says that there is a great controversy going on between the force of good and evil, between Christ and Satan. And he always praised the, the great master, Satan, as a super intelligent being that he is, beautiful, to behold, and if he ever appears to you, you won't be able to look upon him because it'll be too bright. It'll just ruin your vision. The high priest said he was in Chicago, and the spirit appeared to him and said, Marno and his buddy, George has invited them to, to the service, and the fellow that is in charge while you're away says that he's going to wreck all the work that the spirits have done for the last few years to get these people into the society. So the, the high priest, which is in Chicago, picks up the phone and calls, and the spirit appeared to him, and he said it was, the spirit, the angel was so bright that he could not look upon, it, upon him. And he says after he picked up the phone to dial, he couldn't dial the phone because of the fact that his vision was so terribly blurred by the light, the beautiful light of the bright being. And he asked, the, he, you know, dial zero, and the operator came on, and he, he, she had to, you know, dial for him. And they talk about uh, many, many things in regards to, you know, who's going to win this conflict. Any, and, any discussion about uh, fire and brimstone? Yes. <clears throat> he says, the Bible people, talking about the Christians, you know, they read in the Bible that, uh, you know, we're all going to land in a lake, a lake of fire and this and that. See, that's baloney. He says, the conflict is going to end peacefully. Christ is going to realize that, that he might as well abdicate the rights of this planet, take his few people on with him to his planet in the center of the galaxies, and we will be left with a master who will resurrect all his people that will be as numerous as the sand of the sea. See? And the master will rule forever and ever and ever. A happy people. Any name, somebody people going to, the people is going to be there. I don't want to mention the names because uh, <laughs> they're known to history. Yeah, so that was quite uh, impressive. Did you always feel, Roger, that these people were telling the truth? Oh yes, yeah. yeah they were. They, they really had things down straight. Um, but uh, I was not satisfied with with the uh, the answers. And I was getting, I was, there was, I, there was something, and I understand now, it was the Spirit of God saying, hold back, fellow, hold back. And uh, 
the priest that had talked about us thinking seriously about being initiated into the uh, um, their into cult. The right. So they let you come to sort of a mm -hmm. take a look, see, yeah. but you can't go back for several months. Oh yeah, it's not a matter of whether you're going to be initiated or not. It's, it's when. when. <laughs> okay. You see. So they begin to press you for a commitment. So the priest said, "Look, fellas, I'm not going to pressure you into anything. Okay. What I want to show you what the spirits can do for a devoted." servant. We went downstairs, not through the, the, uh, the staircase that I talked for the worship room of the gods, but at the other, other end of the building, went downstairs. And a number of times I'd gone there to the men's room and I heard these typewriters slipping like the dickens. Man is going. I said, why do we have a lot of people typing in there, in that room? Well, we went there that, 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 that evening and he knocked and the man says, come on in. And there was all those typewriters moving along by themselves, typing at the speed that I'd never seen before. And not only that, this, the, the high priest says, I want to show you something clever. So he says, follow me. So we went around the table, that was a, like two long tables, and they had about 10 typewriters. And he says, now notice that, that the typewriter types to the right, then, then doesn't go back. It types back to the left. Isn't that something? I had never heard of things like that before. He said, the spirits are doing the work. And he introduced us to the man. And the man is a lawyer. And he said, how much money did you make last year? Or well, he says, send the six figures. You see? So this lawyer had a business yeah. in the building that housed the worship room. Oh, yeah. And he had a whole room full of typewriters. Yeah. And he put paper in there, and demons That's typed. all he did, put typewriter, uh, paper in there. I, it was and, and what came out? What was it that came out? Different uh, uh, briefs for mm. court uh, cases. And so he would sell these yes. to people? Oh, what? yeah. Okay. He had the service to, to, to the, uh, to the uh, legal profession. And the high priest was the showing... The United States and Canada. So the high priest was showing you this mm -hmm. to give you an idea about the kinds of blessings that you would That's receive. That's right. Yeah. But after you left that typewriter, the, the room where the lawyer was, mm -hmm. they tried to draw you into a commitment by getting you to make a public oh, profession. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, they have a, a super beautiful resort in the Laurentian Mountains, which is north of Montreal. North of Saint Agathe. Saint Agathe is a famous name there in, in Montreal. Montrealers, because they all go Saint Agathe or north there, you know, the summer home and that. So they had a, a big uh, uh, resort up there. It was people, you know, it was a close uh, society, and they had uh, uh, on uh, October the thirtieth, Halloween. Is that uh, October thirty-one? Thirty-one. Yeah, last day of uh, October. Uh, they had uh, what they call live animal sacrifices. I don't know what it is, but they did. We, we, we could never find out. Uh, by the time that, I l that the Lord pulled me out of there, I had not yet found out what it, what it was. So you have this uh, intrigue involved in there. And um, you talked about um, three, three very unique services that, that I had attended there that sit on my mind forever. One was entitled, Christian idolatry. <clears throat> Another one was entitled The Super Deception of, of a Glorious New Age, which actually applies to the New Age today. And this was 1946 that we we're talking. And then the other one was Satan's Great General Council of the 1700s. And I must say the things that I heard there was an eye opener. First of all, we'll go through the Great General Council. Okay. At the beginning of the 1700s, said the high priest, Satan and uh, all his spirit counselors held a great general council with one purpose in mind. It was to prepare for the great industrial age that was soon to break upon the world. And uh, Lucifer also foresaw another age that was to follow that, where tremendous scientific discoveries would be made by people and we would enter a, a unique age that would change the way that everybody lives. It would also serve to usher in the end times and the close of the great controversy between the forces of good and evil. 
And the priest said that, that Lucifer had been studying the Bible. And he found in, the, in Daniel 12, 4, where we are told about the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, knowledge shall be in increased. Mm -hmm. He understood it to be that we're getting to that point. And he had, with all the spirit counselors, to change their modes of operation in order, you know, to ensnare people. Mm -hmm. And uh, they devised a way whereby people would disqualify themselves from being members of Christ's kingdom. And he was just very candid about this. Oh, yeah. Telling mm -hmm. you and yeah. the rest of the group, 60 or 70 people there, yeah. the plans that yeah, close to 100 people. Lucifer he, had revealed to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time the council came to a close, they had three major policies that were going to be followed. First, they were to see to it that humans would be made to believe that Satan and his angels do not really exist. Because up to that time, you could walk down a, a street of Paris and you would have signs that would, that would say where you have a, a soothsayer or, you know, or a, a fortune teller of some type. And, and if you want to put a, a curse on someone, you could go and see this other old lady over there, you know, the, the old witch, that's the way it goes. Uh, but now it had, it had to change. Lucifer says, we have to make sure that people, humans, get to believe that, uh, that Lu Satan and his angels do not really exist. You know, Roger, that's interesting because a recent research study report that I read indicated that in a national survey, I believe it's over 75% of people mm -hmm. do not really believe in a real tangible devil. Mm -hmm. But there is one. Oh, yeah. Now, the next thing that the... the, the three parts policy that they had uh, adopted there. The second one was to find a way of being able to get total control of people's minds. And that would be done by taking hypnotism out of the realm of the occult and introduce it as a new science for the benefit of mankind. So part of what the high priest told you was Satan's strategy to take total control of people's minds. Mm -hmm. They felt that uh, by taking hypnotism out of the realm of the occult and introducing it as a new science for the benefit of mankind, they could then use people of great renown, educators, people of capacity, that would uh, do great things such as supposedly regress people in time to, pre to former lives that they had. And, of course, after the session is over, the person would not know a thing about ancient history. And the person that she's talk, she or he has talked about uh, performing, you know, certain deeds, we'll say, uh, three or four thousand years ago. But this was their, their strategy. Now, what this would, uh, would do for the thing is this, that uh, it would create in the minds of the general public, solidly set in the mind of the general public, uh, an unwavering trust in that great deception. In other words, people could, you know, it, they would believe it. This person is, is, was hypnotized, was regressing time to, you know, former lives, and uh, did this and did that, and no deception, maybe Alexander the Great, we will say, uh, you know, and some of his generals and people like that. And the person after the session is over, you know, brings out, comes out of hypnotism, and he or she doesn't know what she's talking about. So. So now this would be a way of, of uh, de-Christianizing the Western world through the avenue of mysticism. Mm. Now the time came when uh, Lucifer decided that he had to choose a person to initiate this thing. And uh, Franz Mesmer, which was an Austrian physician, was chosen. Because and the priest told you all of this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because he was most capable. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> Mesmer originated a theory called animal magnetism, later on, later on named mesmerism. Mesmer was led by the spirits to believe, and this is what the priest said, was led by the spirits to believe that certain persons have a magnetic influence within themselves, so to speak, that would cause them to have great power over, over other persons, 
even to the point of placing them into a trance. Hmm. And uh, at that time, that was readily accepted by people in general, at the, at the time that uh, Mesmer lived. So people realized, you know, they said that some people have the capacity to put you into a trance. That's the way. Now, by the time that he died, In 1815, a lot of the physicians in Europe were using hypnotism as a means of anesthesia. Now, hypnotism is the same as mesmerism. That's right. Okay. So, mesmerism has, that's been uh, uh, developed to a higher degree of uh, refinement. And uh, <clears throat> the priest went on saying that he, the plan of Satan, uh, to um, deceive the human family this way. He says it's the most intriguing thing to his mind. And he went on saying how it was going to be brought about. He said that a fellow by the name of uh, Darwin and uh, another fellow by the name of uh, Thomas Henry Huxley would be used by the spirits because in their uh, childhood they had been hypnotized by medical doctors. And they figured that, that they would be real good subjects uh, to uh, lead the people into this belief um, that they had, uh, that Satan wanted to bring into people's lives. Now, what were those three points again, Roger? The three things yeah. were, number one, that they did not want Satan, Satan did not want the human family to think that he or his angels existed. Right. The second point that you made had to do with taking control of people's minds. That's right. The third point was what? Was to destroy the Bible without burning it. Okay. See. And what was his strategy on that? On that, um, it was very interesting. Because after the Great General Council, it was decided that Satan would tutor Charles Darwin personally in setting up the, uh, uh, the principles of his theories of evolution. He was tutored by Lucifer himself, the fallen Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was understood, Satan and his uh, spirit counselors understood that if a person was led to believe in the theory of evolution, it would, in his life, destroy completely the, the, the uh, creation week of the Bible, the fall of man, and the plan of redemption. It would do away with it. In one fell swoop. Yeah. Now, he made a, a unique statement. He said that according to the spirits, anyone that teaches a theory of evolution is considered to be a minister of a great religious system. See, they call it the religious system, the theory of evolution, <laughs> because it is a, a system of schooling people and getting them to disqualify themselves from being members of Christ's kingdom. And he said that every teacher of that theory is recognized by the spirits as a person of great value and receives a very special unction from Satan himself, giving great power to induce spiritual blindness, to convince and convert. Three capacities are given to those teachers of the theory. Then, that's not all. The priest says that Satan considers the teachers of the theory of evolution to be so valuable to him that in the sight of all the inhabitants of the galaxies, he assigns a retinue of bright, beautiful angels to follow that, that uh, educator all the remainder of his life. And that in the sight of the inhabitants of the galaxies is the greatest honor that he can bestow upon his workers, on mankind, and to, uh, you know, until the controversy is finished. Mm -hmm. That was quite uh, enlightening. Now the high priest, was talking just sort of like a preacher would talk up front? Was he enthusiastic? Did he have a, was he, did he seem like he had bought into this and was excited about it? Oh yeah, he believed it 100%, no question about it, so everything. Why, why would he be so excited about <coughs> spirits trying to deceive human beings? Because obviously out of this council of the 1700s, deception was a major part mm -hmm. of the strategy. Why? What he says is deception. 
It's like politics. You know, you believe in one candidate, the other person believes in the other candidate, and they're all they're, they're fighting to get to get you know the position, and it's just a matter of who's gonna be the smartest. And with uh, Lucifer, the fallen cherubim, uh, he's very smart. He's gonna win, and Christ gonna abdicate the the you know the rights of the planet. He's gonna resurrect his people, have established his kingdom to last for uh, ever and ever. God won't be able to destroy him because it would be against against God's uh, the Creator's nature to destroy Lucifer in the fire. Beside that, he said, uh, spirits now, even spirits, they have the capacity now to outlive fire. He says, you don't believe it, go to India or, or, or some of those uh, countries where they have uh, uh, fire walkers. And it's done by the power of even spirits. These people are energized by even spirits so they can walk on those hot coals without burning themselves. And this is what the high priest said. And he says, if they want to use uh, fire, they can use it. It's not going to burn anybody. So that's the way, that's the way they believe. Once so they believe. This, this high priest was almost talking to your group in an evangelistic fervor. Oh, yeah, because he figures that uh, he's going to be one of the higher-ups in, in, in the great kingdom. Okay. So now, of the group that was there that night, 60, 70 people, I think you've mentioned before. Yeah, it varies. How many of those were people who were hardcore members, and how many of them were new inductees? Well, we, were only, we were the only two uh, was youngsters, you there, and, so to speak. You and your friend. And how old were you at that time, Roger? I was about uh, 20. 20 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah, 20 years Did old. you have a feeling of awe over the fact that you had been chosen? Yes, in a way. And then I, I got thinking about this. When am I going to have to pay the price? The cost. My parents had brought me up like this. If you get involved with evil, you're going to reap what you sowed. So you want to uh, be upright in life. And if you associate with evildoers, they'll probably lend you in jail or somewhere else that you wouldn't want to be. So you, there's always a price to be paid. So you had that little something yeah. maybe instilled by your mother yeah. Yeah. and father a long time ago that kept you from yeah. making that full commitment. Now, one of the things that uh, really amazed me and, and uh, shocked me and made me sick at heart. It's when the priests uh, talk about uh, Christian idolatry. What is Christian idolatry? The priest mentioned that word. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us what he said, Roger. He said that Christian idolatry is the, the, the most grandiose or great deception that has ever been brought up upon the uh, human family upon mankind. And he says, in, and he boasted, that demon spirits are continually defiling Christian churches through the avenue of necromancy by using a form of spirit worship that involves hundreds of millions of Christians into idolatry without their being aware of it. Now, what is necromancy? Describe ne or define necromancy for me. Their belief, popular belief of necromancy, is to conjure the spirits of the dead. So that you can speak with someone who has died. Right. Like the seance that you originally went to mm -hmm. was the practice of necromancy. Yeah. Now, the priest says that the su this super deception is brought about in only one way. Through the deceptive belief that man has an immortal soul that lives on after death. And he said that constitutes idolatry, idolatry through necromancy. So he says there are hundreds and millions of Christians that are practicing idolatry. What do you think? They're glorifying God. Eh, you see? Because they believe that the soul is immortal. Yeah. They may not be talking to the yeah. supposed spirits of the dead. Oh, yeah. Contrary to popular belief, necromancy does not consist of conjuring the spirits of the dead. The reason being that man is totally mortal and does not possess an immortal soul. So, who are they talking to? He says, the friendly demon spirits that have always found over the centuries great delight in impersonating in apparitions departed loved ones and persons of great renown. Now, friendly demon spirits. Friendly demon spirits. Are there more than one kind of demon oh, spirits, yeah. mm -hmm. Roger? Well, there's three main divisions, and then there's divisions within those divisions. You have the friendly demon spirits that seem to have uh, the finesse and the refinement and uh, they're not upset about what happened when they were thrown out of heaven 
I want to gather. Then you have the warriors. They like to bring misery and destruction in the lives of people. Then you have the oppressors. And the oppressors are, are the real wicked spirits that, that hate God with all of their, the creator with all of their might. You know. So he went out explaining. He says, now, necromancy is in reality a belief, a religious belief. People believe that the dead have entered into a higher state of existence than they had when they were alive. Also, that they are in a position and have the capacity to help the living here on earth. See? Then he said, it's, he says, this is where things get really interesting. He said, according to the great master, a person does not have to supposedly call upon the spirits of the dead to receive help, you see, to be involved in the necromancy. All he needs to do is to believe in life after death. Because he said, necromancy is the belief that man is human, uh, as a human being, as an as immortal soul. So anybody that believes that man has an immortal soul is involved in necromancy. It's that simple. That's the way he explained it. Hmm. Yeah. So how does that <coughs> constitute idolatry? By people believing that they are either talking to the saints, you see, the spirits of the dead, dead saints, or a dead relative, or a dead person of some type. And you take, for instance, like uh, Loretta Lynn. She owes, she says on national television, and uh, I have the data on it, that, that, that I heard it myself. She said that she was made successful in her singing career by a dear friend of hers. It was the same age as she, and died when she was 18 years of age. And L uh, Loretta was trying to get into the, the singing world, you know, but it, it, it would, she says, I had no success at all. Until one night I was sitting in bed reading a book. And she says, who walks right through the wall but my, my friend, the spirit of my friend. And she says, Loretta, I'm going to make you a very famous person in singing Western uh, country music. And I will be with you all the time. Trust me. And she says, uh, she had a big concert one, once and she was coming down with this bad cold. And she thought that her voice was going to give. She talked to her spirit and felt, felt that she was going to be helped. And she got in the, on the stage and she started to sing and right in the middle of where she really needed uh, the power, no power at all. And her spirit friend tapped her on the shoulder and said, and started to sing for her. She said, her voice went through me, the power. See? And you saw this in a television documentary? Tele yeah. This was, I believe, 1976 it took place. Now, the priest explained that when people believe in uh, this business, they are actually opening themselves to be completely deceived by demon spirits because it gives the demon spirits an opportunity to impersonate the dead, see? And for people to believe their lies. And the priest says that thrills the... It, first of all, it says it brings the great master the respect and the reverence that is due to his great name. And it makes all the other spirits exceedingly happy because they are the ones that have worked to lead people to believe in life after death. See? And they rejoice. Also. And that's the extent of uh, what Christian idolatry is all about. Friendly spirits, just to digress for just a moment. You mentioned three different categories, and the friendly spirits are the ones that love to in, impersonate oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, a being, a historian yeah. or something. In yeah, your they specialize in that. In your experiences in the praise services or in the worship room or the other places where you were, any of the places you were, mm -hmm. did you ever witness a, an event where necromancy or even uh, something that would be popularly called channeling today mm -hmm. took place, where you actually heard the voice of someone in response to someone's oh, yeah. questions? Yeah, a number of times, but there was one time in particular that fascinated me because <clears throat> um, it was unique in, in one way. The priest told us that there was a French historian that was affiliated with Montreal, uh, University of Montreal, which is a French university 
in, in the English University is McGill. So the University of Montreal is the French uh, uh, university. And this man was from Paris, but he's affiliated with the university. And he wanted to have some details in regards to uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and one of his generals. So, by the way, there are also, in other parts of the world, elite spirit worshippers like the group that we had in Montreal. And he mentioned there that, uh, he said, you guys are fortunate when uh, my friend and I uh, went in because you are right in time to see something very interesting. My friend there is having his devotions and the worship room of the gods, and he will uh, use uh, a trans medium to converse with uh, certain demon spirits that uh, will inform him uh, in regards to ancient history by Napoleon. And sure enough, we went down there and uh, uh, somebody came up and said he's ready to for the, the session and we went down there and uh, he said he would need uh, three people. Um, he would need three people but he wanted five people that volunteer to be the channel for the spirit, okay? So, he was, three, was three of them were chosen there. And he had went back and sat down. And uh, the man shook his head like, a little bit like this. His eyes went glazed, and he stayed at it for a half hour. And the spirit spoke to him. He said, I'm a, I'm a spirit counselor, and what would you like to know? Yeah, he, said, uh, the, uh, he, said, he had a clipboard, historian in asking some questions. This historian was from Paris. Yeah. And he was wanting information. S some detailed information. Uh, about Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte and one of his generals. And so he asked the questions of one of these human beings mm -hmm. that was channeling. Oh yeah, the voice changed and everything. The voice changed of the, the person completely. Okay. And, uh, the, and it identified itself as a spirit guide. Oh yeah, spirit counselor, yeah. Okay, a spirit counselor. And yeah and then proceeded to tell him all the events that he was asking, yes. answer his question? and there was a, a certain question that was asked, and the Spirit Counselor said, I will have Lord Remy and Lord Alphonse duplicate, in other words, the, con the uh, dialogue that had taken place. Oh, a in little, the two little other, drama. Yeah, a little in the two other uh, men, men uh, fulfill what he was looking for. But the one thing that interests me, is uh, the mayor of Montreal, Camelien Hood. During World War II, at the beginning of the war, he was very controversial when it regards to, to the war effort. He, was, he would tell the French-speaking boys not to go into the uh, armed service, you see, because you're going to go and shed your blood for the British, you know, <laughs> and uh, we're you know, with their servants, so to speak, and all that, and he didn't want him to go in, into war. And they put him in prison. He was jailed for the, for the length of the war. For this. Now, the man said, I would like to have you tell me to the spirit uh, to give me part of the speech that was given by Camelien Hood on, on these uh, steps of the Montreal City Hall, on a certain date, there are different versions of what has taken place, and you, Lord, would know the, the exact one. Now, the mayor of Montreal was still alive. Was still alive. And this historian is asking mm -hmm. what was actually said at a speech. Yeah. Okay. The spirit counselor said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. All of my activities and my people have taken place in Europe. However, after my departure, uh, our departure, other spirits will come and help you. And sure enough, the, 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 the guy vibrated a little bit and he's back and he said, boy, how long? Uh, said, 20, 20 minutes has been used as a channel. So they, um, again, the spirit entered into him and uh, the spirit said that he was a spirit counselor that could give him the information that he was looking for. So, um, again, it was given verbally, and it was the voice of Chameleon Hood. Now, how did you know that it was the voice? Well, because of the fact, you see, I was a youngster in those days, <laughs> just about ready to go into the army. And uh, Chameleon, we used to listen to the uh, radio, 
we had no television in those days, so it was only radio and read newspaper. And all the speeches of coming in made and all of it was on the radio all the time. Now in those days, they had no tape recorders, as we have now. So they would, coming in, would have to go to the uh, Canadian Broadcasting studio, studio where they made a record, a real phonograph record. And then they played it over and over, you know, for the rest so of the So you day listened to those as a teenager before you went into oh, the Army. So you yeah. knew his voice. So I knew his voice really good. So uh, I said to uh, uh, George, he was sitting next to me, he said, isn't it amazing? He said, if you think that's amazing, wait, he says, until the spirits uh, impersonate one of the departed people that you know personally, like an uncle or a brother or a sister or something like that. He says, that is unique. But that's the way it was. You are able to reproduce a, a voice, man, and the, the, uh, just the perfection. The spirits are exceedingly proud of this because, and, and this also uh, was right up my alley, the priest said that as the times on this planet gets more and more difficult and calamities of all kinds are striking the planet more and more frequently, demon spirits are going to impress people with, with the, the importance of Sunday sacredness. Roger, when I was a teenager back in the 1970s, I remember a song that came out talking about the age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. And since then, we've seen the development of the New Age, and I wondered if back when you were involved in spirit worship, if they talked about New Age at all. Oh yes, it was a big thing that uh, was coming up, one of the uh, major deceptions of the last days. And the priest uh, told us, uh, he had, we talked uh, quite a while, and uh, then he said, uh, could I have a little bit more of your time? I want to tell you something very fascinating. He says, the grain plain, the master's grain plain, for harvesting the nations, uh, for, for harvesting the multitudes of the earth into his cause, just before the close of the great controversy between the forces of good and evil. So he continued, you know, after we... Uh, express ourselves that we're deeply interested to know more about the activities of spirits. And he said, it's going to be done in a unique manner. This, this grand plan is, is, is going to take people, people are going to eat the stuff. Because he says, spirits, demon spirits, will declare themselves to be inhabitants of far distant planets in the galaxies that are coming to warn the inhabitants of planet Earth of the impending destruction of the planet unless something seriously proper is done to avoid it. And he went on say, so, saying that uh, uh, they will claim uh, to have out-of-body experiences. Are you familiar with out-of-body experiences? Mm -hmm. I've read about them. In other words, so a person's, uh, there's some persons are supposed to be able to, you know, uh, they believe in their immortal soul. Astral soul projection. Pro yes, right. Goes into different parts of the world and sees things and come back and then they write all about it, you know. I've heard of that. So, <laughs> due to the fact that the millions of the earth people believe in having people having an immortal soul, it has to be readily, readily accepted when the spirits will, through a trans medium, converse with influential people of the land, you see. Now, what is a trans medium? It's a channeler today. What, what is known today as a channeler? Channeler, yeah. Okay. Uh, Shirley MacLaine's experience of getting involved with spiritism and with the uh, inhabitants, supposed inhabitants of far distant plants in the galaxies, I taped the whole thing it's three hours. Yes. And you were hearing the fulfillment of exactly. what this high priest had said yeah. 45 years ago. Yeah, exactly. So he went on explaining about the fact that the spirits will show themselves willing to give valuable guidance that will not only help people avoid the destruction of the planet, but it will cause it to enter into a higher state of existence. For instance, he said, the spirits will, will uh, promise, and this is a big word, promise, that if their recommendations are followed carefully, they will usher in a glorious new age of peace and prosperity and there, there'll be, um, well, there'll be no more wars, you see. Uh, 
There'll be no more famines. There'll be no more uh, people getting unhappy with one another. Neighbors will love neighbor, and uh, social unrest will not take place no more. It'll be sure, uh, there'll be <laughs> perfect happiness for a thousand years. That's what the Spirit is going to promise. And Almost we'll, like the Garden of Eden created all uh -huh. over again. And now we find that a lot of preachers are, pre are preaching the great age of uh, glorious new age of victory, victory over wars, victory over social unrest, victory over famines, and victory over all kinds of... Uh, and he things. used the words new age to describe well, hmm. what was coming. It would be a glorious new age, yeah. And uh, this is exactly what the movement is all about today. Hmm. And he went on and said, as I said a little earlier, <laughs> that as life on this planet becomes more and more difficult, and calamities will strike the planet more and more frequently. The spirits at that time is go are going to put all their effort to impress religious leaders, to bring before the, the masses of the earth the, the sacredness of Sunday. See? They will teach Sunday sacredness. And with the religious leaders, looking forward to a thousand years of perfect peace on earth, they will put all their effort into it. Then laws will be passed by governments. Uh, yeah, when one person asks, what's going to happen about people that don't believe in the Spirit's uh, recommendation? <laughs> the priest says, that's be no problem at all. Laws will be passed by governments that will force people to go along with it, regardless of whether they believe in it or not. And he says, the law enforcement officers will explain to people, make it clear, that such a law is necessary to assure the well-being of all people. Says the laws will be passed, no effort at all. And then he, he went on and he, and, and he said about the fact that um, uh, the venerability of the sun, which in ages past was such an irritant to the Creator, all the, these great nations and other nations of smaller ones were all involved in sun worship. And in those centuries, the Creator found that teaching of the worship of the sun to be a terrible irritant. And he said, it is going again to take place, but not in worshiping the sun, in remembering Sunday to keep it holy. He made a statement I would never forget. He says, by the observance of the day upon which the master, Satan, has placed the unction of his authority and power, He receives homage, regardless of whom people claim to worship. Isn't that something? Hmm. So, can you understand now why I had 28 Bible studies in one week and started to, to go to church on Sabbath, and I never missed since uh, until I began to sick. So. The issue of a day of worship came up in that meeting. Mm -hmm. Was Sunday the only day mentioned? Well, you see, the, the priest mentioned yes about the fact Satan has chosen Sunday as his day. The Creator has chosen the seventh day of the week. Lucifer has chosen to call his day the first day of the week, Sunday. See, And regardless of what people uh, claim to, to worship, worshiping God, the Creator, by observing that day, that particular day, they are bringing homage and respect. Now, at that time in your life, you were 20 years old or so. Mm -hmm. Had you ever heard of a Seventh-day Adventist? Never in my life. In no, that meeting... They didn't talk about Seventh-day Adventist. They talked strictly about Adventist. Well, they just talked... But they did... The word Adventist yeah. was mentioned. The priest was telling us that uh, necromancy, as I mentioned earlier, is the belief that the dead have entered into, into a higher state of existence, etc. And he says, for centuries, Friendly demon spirits have worked diligently to establish and uphold in the religious convictions of all people the belief that man has an immortal soul. See? Then he boasted about the fact that the master was so smart in that he had this, deceived the whole world even this, in this age of great scientific knowledge and, and understanding. 
Then the one person put his hand up. Okay. Priest says, yeah, yes, we want to say something? He says, what about the Adventists? <laughs> you can't count them to see regarding the, uh, the, the state of the dead. And I got a question. What about, how come they, 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 they can't be brought under the great deception? The priest said, you, you're, you're right. I apologize, says here, I, I made a mistake. When I said that the, the, all the millions of people living on the face of this planet, everybody, you know, was honoring the, the great master. I forgot the Adventists. There's so few in number when you figure the, the billions and all people, I didn't even mention, think of mentioning them. So I'm sorry. Then he says, secondly, the reason why they can't be brought into the great deception, let me explain about it. Now he said, my next statement is going to upset some of you. But what I'm telling you is the honest truth. It, it, it is factual. It's reality. The fact that the Adventists observed the biblical Sabbath of creation and reverence the Creator on that day, it makes it impossible for the spirits to deceive them. They are given very special help and great in, in spiritual insight. And he said, under these conditions, they are not ordinary people. And that stayed with me, man. Just like this. And when I heard the, 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 the word Adventist, when Sarah told me later on, which we're going to cover later, I asked him, I said, what did not mission you belong to? He said, I'm a seventh Adventist. What is that again? He said, I'm a seventh Adventist. I said, is that the same thing as, as Adventist? Oh, yeah. He says, a lot of people call, call us the Adventist. They don't talk about, about the seventh days. Same thing. Boy, I was interested. I bet you were. Now I wanted to know what his Bible said. Yeah, I bet you did. Because that was the one group yeah. that the under question only, the high priest of the demonic mm -hmm. uh, uh, worship house. Yeah. The thing that he had said to you was, "This is the one group that can't be deceived." That's right. And so somewhere back inside that mm -hmm. that uh, that resistance you had had mm -hmm. came out, and you awoke. A few months later, that experience, unique experience, was instrumental in helping me make a decision for Christ. And also, I had no hesitation to join myself to God's commandment keeping people because of the fact that I knew what kind of people they were. And after having had 28 Bible studies in one week, I started to keep the, the Sabbath, uh, you know, kept forever. But you see, the time that I had these Bible studies, four hours per evening, we started at 7 o'clock and finished at 11 o'clock at night. We had this Bible study similar to what you, have, what you showed me the other day, that you have in your pocket. The Bible studies were about an hour. There were questions, and then you looked at the verses that they gave you in the Bible, and you had your answer. It was so fantastic. And uh, the Spirit of God was really ministering to me the graces of redemption. Every moment of that, of all those uh, Bible studies, was precious, 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 precious. Roger, at that time, your major language was French. You did not speak English, and all of this happened in the French language mm -hmm. in Montreal. How long after you became a Seventh Day Adventist, or after you learned of Seventh Day Adventists, did you read the book *Great Controversy* by Ellen White? Well, <clears throat> I. Um, Joined the church. Uh, I mean, I mean, I first had the Bible studies in October of '46. In April of '47, I was baptized into the church. In October, uh, September of that year, Hilda and I got married, and the French church in Montreal gave us, as a wedding gift, the Conflict of the Ages series. And I had not read the Greek controversy up to, up to then. But then you read it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what went through your mind when you read the book *Great Controversy*? Yeah. Thinking back on the experience you'd had maybe just a year or so before. That's right. What went through I your said, mind? This, this person is inspired. This person has got knowledge that nobody else has on the face of the earth, except, you know, the spiritist that I was mentioning, because it's so unique. See? Well, I find it very remarkable that they were willing to share the strategy that Satan is working on yeah, but with this group. Of course, their plan was that it would never get out. That's right. Under seal of death. They're, they're, that's right. Their plan is that uh, you don't have to worry about saying anything by the great master. Because as soon as, as anybody uh, strays some, the spirits will tell the, the high priest right away it's taking place. They did with my Bible study that Wednesday night. I studied on Monday and Tuesday, but Wednesday night, the, 
spirit counselor appeared to uh, the high priest and says, you have one of your defectors. He says, that mono guy, you're going to get rid of him. Because he's out there studying the Bible with the Adventists, the people that, that the master hates, hates most on the face of the earth. And the high priest almost had a heart attack. Because he said, I kind of like you. He said, that's what he told my friend. Because I didn't see him after that. <laughs> but he told my friend to try to convince me to go back, you know, to spirit worship. You know. Roger, you were 72 hours away from making a full commitment to the elite spirit worship. Mm -hmm. How did God rescue you at that strategic moment? Well, I'll tell you, I should really go back a, a couple of weeks in time. Um, as the high priest had talked to us about the advantage of getting initiated in the, in the society on the 31st of October, uh, that uh, night I came home went to bed and I couldn't sleep till about 3 o'clock in the morning because I had all of this experience of the supernatural that I'd gone through for so many months now and my Catholic upbringing that I've had, you know, and uh, questions about God. Now I knew there's a God because the Spiritist <laughs> made me well aware of that. S but <clears throat> I was in a state of, of uh, terrible unrest. I could not, I could not have slept. And without even giving it a thought, somehow, I said, as I was laying on my bed, I said, if there's a God up there that cares for me, help me. That's all I said. Next thing I knew, the alarm ro uh, clock rang, it was 6.30, it was time for me to get up and go to work. At that time, I had changed employment. I had taken a course in, in embroidery um, for the Manufacturers of uh, ladies' dresses in Montreal. There's uh, embroidery companies that makes all this, the piping and sequence work and all of this, you know, uh, uh, fancy, fancy design sure. you know, ladies' dresses. And that's where I was working at the time. You were just 72 hours away, as Karen mentioned a moment ago. You had prayed, without even realizing what you were doing, God was about to rescue you in a very special way. Tell us about that. What happened that Monday morning? Well, let's go back to the Friday. Okay. <laughs> Previous uh, to that. I was working for a, a Jewish firm. And uh, the bosses, one uh, kept the Sabbath and the other didn't. And Harry, which was the, uh, the one that didn't, uh, as I was going out to have my cigarette, at the afternoon uh, break, he said, Roger, when you come back in, uh, come into my office, I want to talk to you. I said, okay. I came back in and he said, uh, close the door. I closed the door. He said, uh, I want you to do me a favor. Oh, what do you mean? Well, I'll tell you what, he said, you know, this last, last uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago, there was a fellow here that I showed around the, around the shop and uh, yeah, I said, yes. Well, he's going to be starting to work here Monday. And he's not just <laughs> an average guy. He's a Christian, but keeps the Bible Sabbath. I said, go over that again. He says, yes, like the Jewish people, he keeps the seventh day Sabbath. Saturday is the seventh day of the week. Well, I said, let me tell you, sir, the nuns have told us that there's been a, a mistake made, made in the calendar that uh, actually what shows to be Sunday is the seventh day of the week. Oh no, he says, there was not no, no mistake made in the calendar, he says. Saturday is the seventh day of the week, and you see it on your calendar, and he says it never was changed, and Sunday is the first day of the week. Oh, I said, that's interesting. I said, uh, I'm gonna have to go to the library and check this out. Oh, you don't have to, he says. He pulled out his uh, desk drawer open, pulls out his, his uh, big dictionary, and he, he looks up Saturday, and it said the seventh day of the week. And he look, looked at it on Sunday, and he said the first day of the week. Okay. Well, I said, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Now, here's what I'd like you to do for me. I'd like you to, first of all, I'm going to have this man work next to you, on the machine next to you. And don't tell him that I want to know what the nomination he belongs to. You've got to be very tactful. You have all the time in the world, even if it takes a month, he says. I just, you know, he says, I, I tell you what, he says, it's the craziest thing, he says that I've been thinking about this guy and I can't get him out of my mind. 
about this, the fact he's a Christian and keeps the seventh day Sabbath, keeps the Bible Sabbath. And he said, you know, I've got more important things to think about than st stuff like that. So he said, I want to find out what the nominee he belongs to. And I just did, I said, why didn't you ask him? Well, he said, no, I wouldn't do that. That's too personal. Okay. So he wanted you to ask him and oh, find yeah. out for him. Find out and not let him know that, you know, the boss was interested, you know. So Monday morning came and uh, uh, the new fellow came in and the boss introduced him to the, the, the people. There was about maybe 50 people working in that plant. And uh, he said, Cyril is an accomplished embroiderer and will be uh, very happy to have him here with us and, you know, made a little speech. Then he walked into the, to his new machine and uh, he says, Roger, meet Cyril. And I shook his hand and uh, we started to work. And it was not more than about 20 minutes that I was working that my machine started to skip uh, stitches. So what happened? You have, to, you have to stop and back up where you were. And you, I was working on sequence. In other words, the sequence come up, there's a, a row of, of thread behind it. It's all on a, it's all a, they're all set up, and it's on a spool. And then the needles put them in there. And it, when it skips, you've got to stop, back up, start over it from where it uh, left off. It wasn't too long that I'd done this two or three times. And that really made you happy, I bet. And I <laughs> was mad. And as a French person. Usually they, they don't uh, go easy on, on the saints and, uh, and gods. That was, <laughs> using some language was not that, that, that great for several. But anyway, that I called the boss over. I said, come see this machine, I'm having trouble with it. Checked it, tried, worked on it for five minutes, you know, work with it. Beautiful. I sit down again, start to work, the same thing happens over again. Harry, after he tried that two, three times, said, Joe, come over. He's the old guy that knows everything about everything, you know in the shop. So he looks at the tensions and uh, just his things and it, he says, it's working beautiful. Well, I started to work again another 20 minutes after, the same thing and I had to stop the whole thing. By then, you know, it was time to go out for the uh, coffee break. Cyril and Cynthia, so good to have you folks come down and visit with us for a short time today. And Cyril, I want to start off our visit by just asking you about an experience you had, I believe, almost 45 years ago. That's right. You had gone to work at a new embroidery shop in Montreal, Canada. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy that was at the next machine to you that first day you went there. Did you notice anything strange about him? Yes, I did notice. Uh, he had some peculiarities that, well, to say the least, uh, they were different. Uh, first of all, when he worked at his machine, when he had a little malfunction, uh, he knew how to well, criticize the machine by using some language that was quite, uh, quite offensive to me at least. He would curse at the machine and uh, in both French and English. <laughs> he was quite a linguist. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when my machine would break, he noticed that uh, I would just fix it and keep on working. Uh, there was a difference and he noticed a difference himself. We were both behaving differently when our machines didn't function right. Now, so that very first day, there were problems with the machines. Your machine and his machine right. had problems. They both had problems. But you had a chance at the break time to get acquainted with him. And uh, how did he approach you? Well, he approached me with, with, the, with a question, sort of. He said, uh, I noticed that when, you, uh, when your machine gives trouble, you don't get angry. You just uh, fix it and keep on working. And uh, I told him, well, it didn't make sense to get angry with the machine. It's an inanimate object. And uh, he sort of apologized for his uh, getting angry with his machine. And uh, we started a conversation there, and it gave me the opportunity to uh, sort of introduce him to some of the things I had experienced just a few days before. And what, uh, were, what were the things that you had just experienced a few days before? Uh, I was getting some Bible studies from a minister named Elder Warren Taylor. <coughs> and uh, although I wasn't an Adventist, I uh, was quite moved by those Bible studies because of the fact that as he gave the Bible studies he kept it quite simple and he would uh, prove everything he would say even if it's from the Bible he would prove it and in some cases he proved it from worldly books such as the Encyclopedia Britannica and he gave good evidence of everything that he was saying was true. So um, 
I started walking out, and, and I told Sarah, I said, have you ever seen such a crazy thing as this, the trouble that I have with this machine? No, he said, uh, it's a new machine. I said, brand new machine, just a month old. He said, that's, that's very unusual. So we go downstairs, and uh, um, I said, do you have any suggestions? How to, how to fix this problem? No, not really, but he says, I have a suggestion that might help. He says, I heard you, he says, calling upon God, but it was not in the way that I would have liked to hear you talk. He says, go easy on God, he says. Did that offend you, Roger? You know, I said, thank you. It did not offend me, because it was pleasant about it. And I said, you know, I said, thank you. I said, I'm sorry if I offended you by my language. He says, it didn't bother me. I said, by the way, I said, this is the opening. You're quite a religious man, I understand. Yeah, he says, I read the Bible and go to church. That's great. I said, what denomination do you belong to? Well, I'm a Seventh Dead Adventist. Excuse me? Repeat that again? He says, yeah, I'm a Seventh Dead Adventist. Did that shock you? Uh, well, the word Adventist shocked me. The Adventist, you see, I had heard so much about the Adventist, but uh, Seventh Dead Adventist, I had never heard the, the name before. I said, uh, what does it signify, the name? He says, well, we're uh, seven day observers. We, we believe in the Bible Sabbath that God has blessed that particular day of the week and has sanctified it and put a special blessing on there and that we ought to count our blessings on the seventh day and, you know, give God the honor that uh, is due to his holy name. Is that any difference between what they call, some people call the Adventists and seven day Adventists? Oh no, it's just the same people. Most people just talk about the Adventists and, you know, people know that they're talking about the seven Adventists. Then your interest was really peaked. Now, now I said, man, what a unique thing to have happened to me, that I meet one of these guys. You're together out there at your first break time, mm -hmm. and you're discussing the, the language on the, the job when the machines had broken down. But you had an opportunity to begin to share some of this newfound faith that you had been discovering. Right. Uh, did you find him to be interested, uh, open? Well, what really happened was um, he would ask questions. And uh, I found out later that the reason he asked questions was when I went to get the job, I was so impressed with Elder Taylor's Bible studies that I told the employer right away that I didn't work on the Sabbath. He said, well, that's all right. You don't have to work on Sunday at all. I said, no, Saturday. So being a Jew, he became rather interested. And he told Roger, and Roger told me later on, check this fellow and find out why he keeps my Jewish Sabbath. So Roger's uh, questions were motivated by the fact that he was told to check. And the more questions Roger would ask, the more interested he became himself. So uh, as he became more interested, and I told him more, uh, he suddenly said, uh, I want to hear more about your religion. And I said, okay, this weekend. He said, no, tonight. So uh, we uh, talked about a number of things. And after lunch, uh, I told him, I said, I want to see you at 3 o'clock. Again, I want to uh, have another question for you. So 3 o'clock came along, we had the, the coffee break. And um, many things had passed through my mind. And I knew that if I get involved with, with the religion, the spirit is going to destroy me. So I had been assured, we are all been assured of that. You don't de deviate from, from the will of the spirits. Otherwise, you're you nothing, your history. So um, I told him, I said, uh, Cyril, would you show me out of the Bible the things you told me today? If I went to your house? He says, yeah. Yeah, he says, yeah, I'd be glad to. He says, uh, um, when, next week sometime? No, no, not next week, tonight. Did he look surprised when you said that? Yeah, he, he surprised. He said, uh, what's the big hurry? I said, I can't tell you why. But it, it has to be tonight or never. He said, you serious? I said, yeah. And you can't tell me why it has to be tonight? I'll tell you the reason why. He says, I would like to have you come another night. Because I have my collection of jazz records that somebody's coming to, to look over. He had been collecting jazz records for years. And he said, I have somewhere, but he's interested to, to buy them. But he said, well, I said, well, forget about it then. And he said, man, 
He said, you really, you really mean what you say? That you want to see these things in the Bible? I said, sure. Okay, he says, come to my place 7 o'clock tonight. Give me his address. So that evening, 7 o'clock sharp, I rang the doorbell. Did that startle you? It startled me because uh, it was fortunate I had 28 Bible studies for busy people, something I just bought. And I ran home, uh, Cynthia and I were married at this time. And I ran home and I told Cynthia, we have to give some Bible studies because this fellow's coming tonight. So I went through the first couple of Bible studies as quickly as I could and got myself familiarized with them. And uh, we got all ready and <coughs> sure enough he came. And we sat in that room, the room that we talked about that burned. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started those Bible studies. And he was very interested. Cynthia, that mm -hmm. first night that you had your Bible studies with Roger, how many studies did you actually do with him? We did four. On the first night? On the first night. We started promptly at seven. And uh, as we went through, and we went through with everything in detail, in full detail. And um, we thought that, oh, this is just going to last the evening, and that would be the end of it. And then he said, no. He says, um, Let's, let's do the next one. So each one. So we didn't finish until about 11.30 or quarter to 12. And when we finished, he'd, he'd, he'd sit around and talk. By the way, he was a chain smoker. The room was covered with smoke. We could hardly see the Bibles in our laps. <laughs> and we had discussed this prior to, about him smoking. And uh, so we decided, we prayed about it, and we asked the Lord that even though um, each time he came, the room was just heavenly, he uh, full of smoke, that we will read his word and that he will take care of the smoke. Now, I happen to be allergic to cigarette smoke, and we were all huddled together. It was, it was really something to have seen us. 28 Bible studies in a period of one week, seven days. Seven days, four hours a night. Four hours per evening, yeah. 28 Bible studies. Now, they didn't plan this. So, <clears throat> as we chatted, and I just met Cynthia, now, um, Cyril told me, I got, I got to explain things to you a little bit. I am not a baptized member of the Seventh Adventist Church. I'm just studying into the, the, the church doctrines with the minister. He says, my wife is a Seventh Adventist. But he said, now I, I think I'm going to be baptized also be a seven Adventist. But I said, I'm not one right now. Now he says, my wife is the one that really knows the Bible. I don't know much about it. And I think that she's got the right study for us tonight. He says, it'll take about an hour. Can you spare that much time? Oh, I said, evening is yours. Well, she had a, a set of Bible studies that were entitled, uh, 28 Bible studies for busy people. That was the title of the, of the series. She, she pulled one out and she says, now we could <clears throat> see here, we, there's a different questions. First, the first one was on the Word of God. And she read the question and said, then we can find the, the verses in the Bible that tell, gives us the answer. And the next question, she said, would, would you like that? I said, beautiful, let's go. So Sarah was sitting next to me with his Bible because he was able to find where it was. I, and I had never opened a Bible in my life. Never. So, because I never had access to it, <laughs> let's put it this way. And that's where it, it started, on the Word of God. After the Bible uh, thing was over, he says, well, did you find it interesting? I said, most interesting, very interesting. I said, what's the next study coming up? Well, he said, the next study, oh, Daniel 2, Prophecy of Daniel the Prophet 2, on the uh, world events, different predicting the different uh, great world empires that were to come into existence in times ahead. And I said, really? That's very interesting. I said, um, how long w would that one take? Oh, she'll take about an hour. She says, yeah, between 20 to 25 questions, says, you know. So um, I said, uh, let's have it now. Oh, well, she said, no. I said, uh, when, when, uh, when could you come back? I said, why come back? Did it, she look surprised? She looks very that? surprised because she, and she looked at her husband. And he looked at me, and I said, hey, you guys like the Bible, or are you getting tired? No, 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 we, we like to study the Bible. I said, let's have another Bible study. It's only 8 o'clock, you see. 
And at that time, you were a smoker, weren't you? Oh, a smoker. You can't say that again. I, I was like a chain smoker, you see. And when I, when I had accomplished something worthwhile, I used to reward myself with a cigar two or three times a week. And uh, this, this, is what the, what, this is what the love of God, the power of the love of God operates in the lives of those that the Lord is trying to bless and in the lives of those that are bringing the blessing. Um, now, this did not take place. First of all, we kept on studying. We had four Bible studies at evening. And when it came to 9 o'clock, we had Daniel 2 over with. I said, what's the next Bible study? And she said, well, oh, the one that we're going to have, uh, will you come on the weekend? Could you come on the weekend? I said, yeah. I said, I can't come on the weekend. What is, this, what is the title of it? She gave me the title. I said, man, that's interesting. It's only 9 o'clock. Let's have it now. Cyril looks at, at her, you know, with very surprised look on his face. And Cynthia, she looked at him. And I said, what's going on between the two of you? <laughs> it's like you have a conspiracy that says that we're not going to study the Bible with this guy more than, you know, that, than uh, an hour or two. But she said, let me be honest with you. Our minister, Pastor Taylor, has been giving us uh, instruction on how to give Bible studies. Because Cynthia says, you know, I never have given Bible studies. And we really wanted to know how to give Bible studies to people that ask us the reason of the hope that it is in us. And he's told us exactly how to do it. You have one Bible study per week. If the people are exceedingly interested, you could have one in the middle of the week, another one. But never more than that. And she says, we've already passed our quota. So the reason, Roger, for their hesitancy Mm -hmm. was not the fact that you were blowing smoke in their face. Oh, no. no they it it was because they were w trying to follow the instructions that their pastor had given, and mm -hmm. you were asking them to break all those rules. That's right. Do you think they could sense your urgency? The Sarah and Cynthia told me later, yes. They said there's something very unusual about this man, Cynthia told her husband, because they uh, went to get uh, water and uh, to get me a glass of water, and uh, she went in the kitchen to get something else, whatever it is. And uh, she said, uh, what do you think of him? And Cyril said, there's something very unusual about this man. He said, you want to study the Bible? Let's study the Bible. We won't tell about Elder Taylor. Let's not say a word to Elder Taylor. <laughs> you know, we're going to ruin the whole thing. We're going to keep it give, a secret. Because the, the minister <laughs> had said, you know, you give people a spiritual, a spiritual indigestion, and they'll never want to open the Bible again. Got to say? But this shows that there are some times when someone's yeah. appetite for it is right. so strong yeah. that you have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yeah. That's it. And they, they had prayed about this thing. Now, Cyril had told his wife, this man is coming for Bible study at 7 o'clock tonight for a Bible study. And he smokes. He's a smoke fiend. What are we going to do? Should we tell him not to smoke in our home? He said that. If we do that, I'm afraid he's not going to stay for the Bible study. What would have happened if they had asked you not to smoke? I would have said, I'm sorry. You're not my kind of people. You see, you're too, uh, you're too reserved for me. I'm sorry. And, I, and, and still to this day, I thank God for the leading of the Holy Spirit that at that crucial time moved in there and inspired these, these people to say, you know, wouldn't you die? Cyril, Cyril for us, to save a soul for Christ, Cynthia said to her husband. He said, yeah. It's not going to kill us, even if we inhale all the smoke that he, that he puts out. Right? Because they had prayed about it, and then they had thought about it, and then when it came to be quarter to seven, he said, what are we going to do about the smoking? Are we going to tell him not to smoke or what? And then when she came out and she, she said, you know, Let's put up with it. Well, we had that third Bible study. Now it's 10 o'clock. And I said, uh, uh, by the way, what's the next uh, title? And she told me about it. Said, My goodness, this is a beautiful Bible study. I said, let's have it. <laughs> and he, he, he said, you know, really, Roger, we've studied too much tonight. We're never going to be able to remember these things. Oh, I said, you'd be surprised. I got a mind, a mind like a sponge for the things that I like. He said, you're enjoying yourself. I said, never heard anything like this in my life. Let's have another study. Why don't you go, people go to bed? First of all, I don't want to, uh, you know, infringe on your, 
on your uh, regular uh, habits of uh, resting yourself. And well, he said, we go to bed at uh, 11 o'clock. Beautiful. I said, go on, uh, Santiago. And Sarah says, go on, Santiago. And we had another Bible study. Now the Bible studies are over. And I said to myself, if I'm still alive, I want to be here tomorrow night. Did you seriously doubt whether you would be alive oh, the following I, night? I felt sure I was going to be killed, going to be destroyed in some kind of an accident. Okay. Uh, because I've heard of so many cases. So I knew that I was not, this is the way I felt. I was not going to be alive tomorrow night. If for some reason I'm alive, I want to be back here with study the Bible with these people, see? So I said, uh, what are you people doing tomorrow night? Not too much. What about seven o'clock, another Bible study? And uh, she looked at her husband and, and she, she he, he looks at her, you know, and, and she, he said, hey, we won't tell Elder, Elder Taylor. We won't tell him a word about it. We'll just do it. We'll just do it. He says, we'll be here at seven o'clock tomorrow night waiting for you. The next night, man, I was there. Four more Bible studies, see, and more smoke. This has been part one of A Trip into the Supernatural. The conclusion of this exclusive interview is contained in part two. He heard footsteps walking down his hall. He lived at the end of a long hall, and his door was the only door down that hall. And the footsteps would stop at his door. Then a rap would come to the door. And at midnight, we heard the footsteps coming down the hall. I said, uh, Roger, put your hand on the doorknob and get ready to pull it open. And so with all the bravado that I could muster with a gun, I uh, waited for the rap on the door and there it came. We continued and we continued to, to give him Bible studies with, with the smoke and all. And we got down to the Bible study where um, a health, diet and health. And body temple. Body temple. And he was fascinated with that. And so we finally told him that, uh, I think there's a text that uh, when men turn away from God, they turn to the bitter eat, um, weed. Bitter herb. Or herb or something. So we like the bitter herb too tobacco and mm -hmm. so on. He was fascinated with it and he says, well why didn't you tell me that you didn't smoke? I think what really got him was the, uh, when he read that, know ye not that your body is a temple of God and if mm -hmm. any man defile a temple of God, him will God destroy. And so he asked me, what do you mean by that? So uh, my reply was, uh, well let's take the church. We all respect the church. Would you take a cigarette into the church and smoke it? He said, of course not. Then I said, uh, would you take uh, alcohol into the church and drink it? He said, no, that would be silly. And so by making those comparisons, uh, finally I said, your body is the church. Your body is the temple. He said, then my smoking? I said, right. He said, uh, why didn't you tell me this on the first night? I said, if I had told you this on the first night, you wouldn't come the second night. He said, you know, that's right. So you can see where patience uh, is, a, is, a, is a virtue. If you use patience and take your time, it pays off. He told us that he realized he was getting into demon worship to the point where it was scaring him. He was frightened. And he prayed a prayer to God, even though he didn't realize it and it wasn't with all the trappings that right. Christians usually use, but he said, if there is a God in heaven, help me. And at that time, you were an answer to his prayer. That's right. But also, weren't, wasn't he an answer to your prayer? He certainly was. When uh, Elder Taylor got to the point in his Bible studies of speaking about the Sabbath, all of my background, I was born in Halifax, uh, Cynthia was born in Montreal, all of my background was Baptist and some Methodist. And I couldn't see going to church on Saturday instead of Sunday. In fact, I would laugh at my wife for quite some time 
even as a child, that the fact that she was going to church on the wrong day. Uh, but getting back to the point is uh, when we were taking those Bible studies and, and Nala Taylor got to the, the Sabbath question, he proved it, yet I didn't believe it. And there's a point in your, in your studying the Word of God that you want to stay with tradition rather than go with the truth. And I wanted to stay with tradition. But at the same time, the truth is pulling me back to the point where I said, I didn't even tell Cynthia this, Lord, if you want me to keep this Sabbath, let me with the knowledge I have win one soul. And if I do this, I know that it will be a sign. And not long afterward, I met Roger, sat down beside him, and he asked me for Bible studies. Mm -hmm. I know it was a sign. I'm here today. What part did Cyril's conviction about the Sabbath truth play in you being confronted by Christ with these eternal realities? So I understand that he wasn't even a baptized Seventh-day Adventist. He was baptized the first Sabbath you went to church. But what if he had not been convicted of the Sabbath and had told your Jewish boss mm -hmm. that he would be willing to work on the Sabbath? Well, I would, I would lose out on eternity, I believe. I would have lost hope. So his conviction yeah. was part of the process that Christ used to mm -hmm. confront you. But the there's more to this. He was working for a, a nice, a real nice firm, embroidery firm. And he was studying the Bible with Pastor Taylor, and Pastor Taylor had, had brought him now to the point where he said, you should observe the seventh day Sabbath. If you're going to, you know, serve the Lord all the way, serve the Lord, serve him all the way. The Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And the Lord says, why he wants us to keep it holy? Because he's, he's God and we're the cre creatures, and that we ought to be counting our blessings, so to speak. Now, Cyril was pondering this thing in his mind, and he said to himself, and he prayed about it, Lord, I want some kind of a sign that you're really with me in this, that you want me to s start s keeping the seventh-day Sabbath now. But Lord, there's something missing. I tell you what, if you make it possible for me to meet someone that doesn't know about the Sabbath, because not too many people know about it anyway, and that I'm able to convince him of the importance of the biblical Sabbath of creation, then he says, I'll know that you want me to start giving a Sabbath now, instead of next year or some other time. And do you know that prayer was answered in two weeks? We figured out a time, about a time that I said, there's a God in heaven that cares for me, help me. I think it's a couple of days after that, that, that he made a decision that, hey, Lord, show me. And, uh, you know, I, I just love, would like to enjoy the experience of knowing that you're listening to me and that you're doing something special for me. And I'm doing something special for you because I'm obeying your commandment. So in reality, Roger, you yeah. were an answer to his, his prayers, prayers yeah. before, while you were still a spiritist. Mm -hmm. Cyril, did you and Cynthia know at this time when you were studying with Roger that he was involved at all with spirit worship? You know, the Lord blessed us mightily. He blessed us with uh, the fact that uh, we were completely ignorant of anything. And uh, I would not advise anybody to openly go and do something like we did w with having the knowledge that uh, this person is a devil worshiper, because no person has the power to overcome this on their own. Uh, but I feel uh, very impressed that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, guided us, mm -hmm. and our eyes were covered mm -hmm. until a certain time that we could handle it. And when was that time, Cyril? When did you discover that this man worshipped demon spirits? Uh, we discovered that midway between the lessons, and uh, I don't know what, exactly what point it was, but one night he came and uh, we had previously studied on the unpardonable sin. And he came with tears in his eyes, and he was very upset. And he said, uh, uh, he said he was upset, and he had books under his arm. 
And uh, I said, well, what are you so upset about, Roger? Roger in French. And he said, well, you don't know what I've been doing. So I said, look, the Bible says all manner of sins will be forgiven. And he said, but you don't know what I've done. So after he told me what he had been doing, worshiping the devil and the, getting acquainted with devil worship and going very deep into it, he showed me some books. And when I opened one of the books and read some instructions on how to worship the devil, I closed it up. I said, I don't want to see this. And uh, I said, but one thing I want to make clear. I said, if you had committed the unpardonable sin, you would not be here willing to study the Bible. And therefore, the scripture that says, all manner of sins will be forgiven, applies to you. I said, you must consider yourself forgiven, and you must forgive yourself. And we went on from there. I didn't even know what a devil worshiper was. I think we were both very naive. And uh, so I went along, and I said, well, I tell you what, we'll leave the fact whether the sin is pardonable or unpardonable to God, and let's finish the Bible studies. <laughs> that, that was m all of the um, information and uh, knowledge that I had. And it wasn't until later, and then he began telling us, uh, you know, a little bit about the troubles he was having, and I, I thought that was rather unusual, and, and, and we're being involved. Now, Cyril, whenever you did learn, you and Cynthia, about this spirit, spiritism business. Mm -hmm. You immediately had a question about whether or not it was real. You, right. you, you, you were really naive about that. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us, you, you had some special dispensation, uh, some special work with the, uh, with the police department there in Canada, and you had the ability to carry a gun, is that right? Yes, I had a permit to carry a gun. And uh, when he told me that not only was he having these manifestations, he was also having he heard footsteps walking down his hall. He lived at the end of a long hall, and his door was the only door down that hall. And the footsteps would stop at his door, then a rap would come to the door. And we were also having trouble with the union at that time. So when he told me about mm -hmm. these rappings on the door, I said, no, oh, that's only those union people trying to come and get you. Yeah. So I said, uh, I'll scare them away just the same as I scared them away when they came to get me. And so I had so much uh, faith in the gun that, uh, don't forget, I wasn't baptized at this time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I had sure. uh, faith in this gun. So I took my gun and we went to Roche's place and we were laughing and talking and just having a jolly time. And at midnight, we heard the footsteps coming down the hall. I said, uh, Roger, put your hand on the doorknob and get ready to pull it open. And so with all the bravado that I could muster with a gun, hmm. I uh, waited for the rap on the door and there it came. And I don't know exactly how many times the rap came. Then. Well, first you opened the door, and yeah. there was nobody there. Right. And you said, now, now his color changed. The color of his face changed. <laughs> the color of his face oh, yes. changed? Yeah, Believe definitely. it or not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> he wasn't expecting union people. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't anybody there. <laughs> there wasn't nobody there. <laughs> what, was your, what was your emotion at that moment, <laughs> sir? What did you, when, you, when that door came open? And there was nothing there. Well, his emotion, excuse me for jumping in here, okay. was that uh, he was almost uh, like, you know, a, st uh, a statue of salt. That, that was your observation, <laughs> yeah. Roger. That's right. So I said, hey, let's sit down, man. I said, the, you know, the, the, they're not going to harm us. So we sat down on several, mm -hmm. and we talked some more. There was no problem. And about 10 minutes later, it's the spirit knock on my balcony door. And the, the, the glass was loose a little bit in there, and it rattled pretty bad. And did he still have all the bravado? <laughs> By, by then, he, he jumped right out of his seat, <laughs> didn't you, Cyril? And he said, let's get out of here, you know, because he had knocked real hard. Yeah. It was at that time I said, uh, Roger, I think it's time for me to get rid of the gun and get baptized. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right, that's right. That made him make his decision that was, to get baptized. Well, I've heard of yeah. lots of ways the decisions are made, um, but that was, that's, that's probably one of the most unique I've heard, Cyril. Dramatic, to say the least. Yes. We were like children dealing with something we had no knowledge about, and he protected us. And uh, like I said, if anyone knows of someone who, who is involved in this, they can't do it alone. Requires See, special prayer and it requires, protection, And it? it requires the Lord to be the one to handle the situation. A man cannot handle the situation because... Uh, the, the powers and principles that's 
involved in this, no man can withstand. What gave you the sense that you now had an opportunity for salvation? What was it that told you you had a chance? Well, um, the Holy Spirit was inspiring me. The Holy Spirit was ministering to me the grace of redemption. And to be able to, to put it into words, uh, I don't have this kind of a vocabulary, because it's, it's, it's a mystery type thing. The Holy Spirit recreates you as, as, as he ministers to you, you see? And, uh, it cleans your mind and gives you understanding and, and uh, you see things in a different light that you never thought about before. Life becomes a meaningful thing all of a sudden and you be waiting to die for it, you see, for, for what you've learned. Because that's what I said to myself. The second night when I went back home, I, I had about an hour in the streetcar to my place. I got home at 12 o'clock. I said, hey, if they do me in tonight, I'm going to have, I have the beautiful experience of having learned these great, wonderful things about God. Beautiful things. So on Wednesday night, there I had the first hope. I can't remember exactly what verse of scripture was, but, uh, but uh, this one uh, here says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You see, and since you had explained what it meant, and you took that right into your heart. Yeah. Roger, during these three days, from Monday night, Tuesday night, to Wednesday night, what went through your mind regarding the spirits? I knew that I was going to uh, be worked over by the spirits, you through one of their boys or some accident or something, see. This is the way I felt, I mean. And um, I said, this is very unusual that nothing has happened yet. And I'm going home on Wednesday night again with, with another appointment for Thursday Bible study at 7 o'clock. Now, let me make sure I understand. You had missed Wednesday night's spirit praise yeah. oh, service, yes. uh, yeah. at which time you were supposed to have I've made your here. full commitment. Yeah, I would have and you had been an at a Bible study instead. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happened next? So I said, um, this will be the end of it. Wednesday night, I said, they'll have a praise session to the gods, and that'll be it. Uh, but nothing happens Wednesday night. Thursday morning, I was alive. And I went back for another Bible study, and, and that is four more. And uh, by then, I realized that the Creator was taking care of things. Because these people never give God the glory, but they always refer to higher powers. They respect, they, re, they, they pride themselves on the fact that they respect authority, you see. So therefore, they, they recognize the Creator for, for who He is. And, uh, but of course, that the Master, fallen Lucifer, is just as smart as God is. And He's got, he's got it worked out, so He's going to have a kingdom to him, Himself for eternity, and you know, you don't have to worry about things. So I realized that, that the power of God was intervening. Now I became a, a brave, see. And the Spirit of God gave me the strength to do that. Because I, I said that God gave me the strength to be able to die for, for these things that I just learned. You see? And that's what happened. I got those uh, Bible studies. So you went ahead and went to a Bible studies on Friday night? Yeah. And then you kept your first Sabbath, didn't oh, yeah. you? Tell, tell us about your experience on Sabbath. <clears throat> first, that evening, um, before I left, 11 o'clock, Cyril says, uh, you enjoy the Bible studies? Oh, yeah, very, very much so. I said, tomorrow you people are going to church. He says, yeah. I said, uh, interesting. He said, would you like to come with us? I said, yeah. Because I had the, had the Bible study on the Sabbath already. I said, sure. I'm still alive. And he said, what do you mean by you're still alive? Well, I said, I said you know, I say, if I'm still alive, uh, I'll be, I'll be here, I'll do this, I'll do that. But I knew what I was, what I'd said, I'm still alive. And uh, he said, would you join us here uh, and we'll walk to church? It's not that, that far, we'll uh, walk a few blocks and uh, nice, uh, be a nice day tomorrow. I said, yeah, sure, meet you here. And uh, we walked to church and we were welcome at the door and there was a rack of, of uh, uh, brochures on the walls. I walked over and looked at some of them, picked up a couple in my pocket and uh, we were from Sabbath school and 
I thought it was great. Roger, the Lord helped you get through the Sabbath day without smoking. How did you eventually deal with your smoking habit? Well, I tell you, Pastor Taylor uh, talked, uh, you know, for quite a while. When it got to be about quarter seven in the evening, I was getting uh, very distressed because I, I got a tremendous urge of smoking about an hour before. And I said, oh, I got to have a cigarette. I just can't stand it anymore. And uh, as the pastor continued explaining what I had to ask him to explain, uh, it was difficult for me. And <clears throat> as he left, I told several uh, and said, yes, I'm sorry, but I, I got to smoke. And um, on the way home in the streetcar, I said to myself, this is going to be, she was expression, but a hell on earth to give up smoking. Then I said, no. It's not going to be, because I'm going to have help. I got to my apartment and uh, I opened a closed closet and I had two cards of cigarettes on the shelf. And I opened them up and threw all the cigarettes, you know, all the packs were opened up, threw them in, into the toilet and, and flushed it down the drain. And uh, then I knelt by the little table that I had there with, with my Bible on it. and. Uh, I had that already had started to read that crucifixion of Christ, which I have read for 45 years now, every morning. Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 24 through 54. Every day, God willing, I, I always read it. Well, now I can I have my devotions at night, and I don't have to put the light on because I know it by heart. See? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, there I place my trust and, and my life in the, in the care of the Lord of glory, who had precious blood precious blood on Calvary, to acquire the legal right to be able to redeem me from where I was and from where I was going. So it was the end of smoking. Never, never had a desire to smoke again. Mm -hmm. I told him to take the desire away to recreate me. I realized that he was a creator he can recreate. Roger, as you came closer to making a full commitment to God, did the demons try to prevent you from making that commitment in any way? Well, I didn't have to wait too long. <laughs> uh, during the week, the Spirit of God held back the, the demon spirit so that he could not have access to me. I realized that from Wednesday night on. Then, as I came uh, home at midnight of that uh, Saturday night, there was a note on my door from my buddy. And he said, it is urgent that I talk to you tonight. I don't care if you call me in the middle of the night. But he says, i got to talk to you. We're having a terrible disaster. Uh, you know, facing a terrible disaster. So uh, I said, well, Roland, one well, must, must have gotten some, some real static, you know. Sure enough. <clears throat> First of all, I wanted to, to review something that we'd studied at night. So I had a book, they, had, they lent me a book, uh, uh, St. Earl, and I opened the book up and I started to, to read. And uh, there was a marker, a sheet of paper actually, it had been cut in half in there. And uh, I had put it on the table. And uh, the piece of paper started to levitate and move around the room. See? So it didn't bother me. I knew, I knew what was, was doing it. And then the, the sheet of paper came and, and stood about a foot above my book. Then it was slapped down on the book, and the book fell on my lap, and almost into the floor I picked it up. And I felt like saying, telling the spirits, you know, buzz off. But uh, I had understood that it's, it's, I would not, again, talk with spirits. I made up my mind on that. So I picked up the book again, started to write, and then the spirit picked up the book and threw it across the room against the wall with tremendous force. So I decided, well, I'm going to go and phone my buddy, see what he's going to do. Now, was a, a phone, a public phone in the hallway. I didn't want to use it. I went down to a, a diner or a restaurant or just uh, down the block, and I called him up. How's things rolling? He says, man, he says, Oh, he says, don't you care for my life, Morno? What kind of a friend are you? 
I've been suffering, he says, since Wednesday. He says, trying to get a hold of you. And he says, I've been waiting at your door. What time did you come home? I said, come home at midnight. He said, you're in real trouble. Because this, the high priest, as a spirit appeared to him on Wednesday evening and told him that you, had, you were studying the Bible with some Christians. But you were not just studying the, studying the Bible with Christians. You were studying the Bible with Seventh-day Adventists, the people that the Master hates most on the face of the planet. How with the world did you get yourself involved in something like that? Don't you care for your life? I said, sure. Beside that, he says, and he told me no, uh, other things that the Spirit had told, uh, you know, uh, the uh, high priest. So it went the conversation, went on the phone for a while, and I said, now listen, it's not possible for me to explain to you over the phone what has taken place in my study in the Bible four hours per evening, you know, through the week. Why don't you come to see me tomorrow sometime, and I'll give you the reasons the real reasons why I did what I did. He said, okay. So we made an appointment for uh, sometime Monday, uh, Sunday morning. And uh, I went back, after my phone call, I went back to my apartment. And then uh, I decided I might as well get to bed. It's light. I get to bed. I was not sooner in bed. The, the lights went on. I got up, went through the lights on. Went back to bed, the light goes on again. I said to myself, there's no use getting up, turning the lights off. They're going to put them back on again. So I'm going to decide to go to sleep with, with the lights on. So after a while, things start moving around the place. A picture on that wall <laughs> goes and sticks itself on the wall. There's no, uh, nothing to hold it up. And the light that was on the table moved and stands in midair. It stays there. See? Were you feeling afraid at this time? Oh, no, not at all. No. No, no because of the fact that, uh, you see, you get, human beings get accustomed to a lot of things. And you get supernatural strength, either from good or evil. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was, was uh, singing me through this thing. And I knew that I was going to have a terrible struggle somewhere along the way, some, somehow. And they were going to try to destroy me, no question about it. So, after this nonsense had gone uh, quite a while, I, I went on to sleep. Hey, I'm going to get my rest. I'm tired. I said, Lord, you know, bless the old guy. I was not old in those days, though. But I said, bless the fellows. I can get some rest from these spirits. And I went to sleep. And they, it woke me up about 2 o'clock in the morning again. And at four o'clock, now four, at four o'clock in the morning there, I, I sat up in bed, pushed my pillow in the back, and I said to myself, what in the world am I going to do? Because the Lord doesn't clear them out of, uh, for me. Then I, I got a thought that maybe the Lord just wants me to know from the spirits exactly how, things are, uh, how I'm standing with them. And I said to the spirit, you want to talk to me? The Spirit said, yes, finally, and we will talk to you. What in the world do you think you're doing? You see, the Lord had held back even on the Spirit, that the Spirit could not talk to me. I realized that they were under a very special control. So I got talked with the Spirit, and I realized that he was a Spirit Counselor, because he said, the Master has tremendous plans for your life. Fame, honor, respect, wealth. Don't you value any of these things? I said, I said, I want you to know, Spirit, that uh, 10 days ago, I would have grabbed your offer. But now you're talking to a former Spirit worshiper, and I'm educated to the reality of life especially of the reality of eternal life. And I said, I'm not interested. For about maybe two or three minutes, maybe four minutes, and it's a long time, in a conversation that was 
no response to what I had said. It was like he was totally amazed by your yeah. courage. Yeah. Then when the spirit spoke again, he had a, 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 a tremor in his voice. In other words, you know when a person gets really desperate in a crisis situation, your voice is, 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 changes. And uh, it gave me the impression that he had a hard time expressing himself. And that was a very clever uh, individual. Well, he said, we've worked for so long, over the years, to prepare you for the Master's work. And what are you doing? You know? And things like that. And uh, he told me, okay, you're, you're, you're turning down the offer of the Master. I said, definitely. He said, from now on, he says, you will, poverty will be a lot of your life. That is, he says, if you can manage to stay alive. And he says, that I doubt it, that you won't want to have much of. He says, your days are numbered. I said, you know, Spirit, the high priest has mentioned about higher powers. Am I affiliated now with higher powers? And I said, I don't have to concern myself with you or your master or any of the other spirits because you're all losers. I am the winner. A hundred million years of perfect life, recreated, translated, or resurrected body that I'll have. Uh, my years will be in, in, counted into the millions of years. If I take the offer of the master, what do I have? I'm 20 years of age. Add, even if I live to be 100, how can you compare that to 100 million years? And I'll have a, all the gold that I want and the silver that you're offering me, and more. So I'm not a loser no more. I'm a winner. And the spirit, the spirit says, will destroy you. And he laughed. He had this, this, this was frightening. For, for, for one time, he had this laugh that, uh, that caused me to think immediately of the laugh that Nero, instantly, Nero must have had on his face when the lions were tearing the Christians apart. That's the thing, I said, this is the way that Nero must, must have laughed. When the, the lions were tearing Christians apart, you know, in the arena of the Colosseum in Rome. Yeah. So how did the spirit finally leave, Roger? They finally leave, almost took the door away with him. <laughs> he left through the balcony door, and the door um, was slammed open, yeah, open. And the, the doorknob almost went through the plaster in the wall. Did he leave on his own accord? I commanded him to. I commanded him in the name of the Lord Jesus to leave my place to come no more. And he left? And he left. And instead of slamming the door shut behind him, like a person would, he slammed the door open as he went out, and he slammed in, in, into the wall of them. And, and the doorknob, Cyril may still remember, you could see the imprint of the uh, doorknob in, in the plaster of an, the house was maybe uh, 50 years old, so the plaster had been settled a long time. You commanded the demon to leave by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yep. And he he left, Jesus. slammed the door. Did you go back to sleep? Yeah. And then the next morning, your friend Roland came over. Well, between that, I'd like to tell you a bit okay. more. I woke up in the morning, of course, and I said, my, time to get up. And uh, my Bible, my night table was to my left. As I was laying in bed, I, I put my hand on the Bible, and then I started to shuffle, you know, the pages like this. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about many things, and I was doing this. And all of a sudden, I opened the Bible wide open. And then I got thinking about it again. Never realized what I'd done. I got up, and after... Uh, I straightened myself out a little bit. I, I, I look at the, at the Bible, and my eyes fell on this uh, Isaiah chapter of I, uh, Isaiah, uh, uh, the prophet, and I got reading, and it was the experience of Ezekiel when uh, Sennacherib, the great general of the armies of the Assyrians, had uh, come past about the city of Jerusalem, and he was telling uh, Ezekiel that he might as well give up open the gates, you know, you're not going to survive this because we've destroyed all the nations uh, 
that we've gone through before getting here. And uh, I was very impressed. The fact that the Zechariah took the letter that the general had sent him, and he went in the, in the temple of the Lord and placed it before the Lord, and he talked to the Lord about the, the letter. You see? And as for his predicting care and, and guidance. And when he had not yet returned to his, to his castle, when as Isaiah came, the prophet, and he told, uh, he says, uh, the Lord has got a message for you. The widowed Sennacherib has come, that's the widow he's going to return. And uh, I love that prayer. That is a kind of prayer. I memorized that. It was a beautiful prayer. Because I got, from that moment on, I got an inner desire to fortify myself with the Word of God. Because every time that I, that I read the verse in the Bible that applied to my condition, I received encouragement and strength. And I said, this is what I need to do. I'm going to fortify myself with, with the Word of God. I'm, I'm going to memorize the Word of God. I, I, I write there and then I took a piece of paper. I underlined those verses of the prayer of Ezekiel in red in the Bible. I wrote down a piece of paper, put it in my pocket, my coat pocket. So when I traveled on the tramway, you see, I could memorize uh, that. And I've done that now for uh, 45 years. I'm still memorizing things, you know, because Elda says to me once, she said, are you still memorizing? I says, yeah. Why are you memorizing? You know so much of the Bible and everything. I said, well, I need some more. You got to get, you got to have, uh, keep feeding yourself spiritually. And that was the blessing that it, that it was. I saw there a beautiful deliverance. And then I read the rest of the chapter and it shows that during the night, the angel of the Lord went out. So when the general and his uh, officers uh, woke up in the morning, they look over the camp and all their soldiers were dead. And they took off for Nineveh before they were done in. And he went uh, to the temple of Nishroch, his god, and uh, Sennacherib. And while he was worshipping there, uh, his sons came in and put a dagger in his back. And he fled to, to the land of the Arameans. I was very impressed with that. And I, had, I left it, the, the Bible open there. I had my worship. When my friend came over, uh, the Bible was still there. So, Whenever your friend Roland came over, you had just finished your worship time and you had read the story about yeah. Sennacherib. Mm -hmm. What did he say? Was, did he feel agitated? Was he upset? Oh, yeah. He came in and sat himself down and he said, I can't believe it. Not of all people, he says, not Mono would do a stupid thing like daring the spirits. You know? He said, you're, you're, in, you're an intelligent man, Roger. You know, you, you got a choice. The high priest tells me that if you come to see him with me now, no problem. Everything is going to be straightened out of the spirits. He promised him that already. He got that assurance. And he said, uh, let's do the right thing. Why gamble with your life? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I don't feel like going to the high priest. Now or ever. And we conversed about, uh, about a number of things. And uh, he said, well, I hate to have to tell you this. But seeing that you don't, you decided that you're not going to have anything to do anymore with, with the master and his people. I hate to tell you this, that the priest, the high priest told me that a price has been put on your life. A medical doctor, remember, gave me the name, has pledged $10,000 to have you done in. How did you feel whenever you found out that you had a contract out on your life? Well, uh, it surprised me a little, but I had, I had prepared myself for something worse. So that I didn't, uh, it didn't bother me too much. Because, see, the strength of the Lord, the word of the Lord, was, the Spirit of God was giving me strength. Okay, was the yeah. presence of the Spirit of God evident to Roland there that Sunday yeah. morning? As we talked, and now he decided that, that he, was losing, he was losing the battle. He became very nervous. And he got up and went to the door, put his head on the door, and we talked there. He says, Mono, please. If it's not for you, say, do it for me. Do you realize what's going to happen to me if something happens to you? 
I don't know how to go to treat me. I said, hey, man, let me tell you something. I got a night, I got a suggestion for you. You, join, you. you come with me. I'll guarantee you all the protection that you need to live the right, ripe old age. And beside that, I'll tell you what. Uh, you should go back and tell the high priest and all his boys to come to our church. I'll arrange with my minister to have a uh, hundred spaces there, right off the center aisle. I felt like I'm making them an invitation. Well, he says, well, I would never say a stupid thing like that. He says, well, that's, that's your responsibility. I said, uh, no, you, uh, things are settled. You lit a cigarette, and as you lit the cigarette, I, I, I saw his hand shake like this. And uh, I said, you're quite nervous. Well, let me tell you, he says, there's a power here, a presence that I'm not accustomed to. I'm very uncomfortable because there's a, there's a power here that, says, that, that, that makes me terribly uh, uncomfortable. Well, I said, you know what it is? The presence of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Creator, the life giver. And I said, every other power is subject unto that higher power. You're aware of that. Oh, yeah. So that's the way that um, it ended. He now, decided to go. He told you that you had a contract put out in your life. Yeah. How did you respond to him? He was nervous, but he said oh, yes. you, you're, yeah. you're walking under the shadow of death, mm -hmm. Morneau. How did you respond? I said, my friend, I've got some news for you. Not so much for you as, as it is for the high priest. And now the Spirit of God gave me very special righteous indignation. Have you ever heard of that terminology? That when I heard that they were going to do me in with, uh, you know, have me shot, I said, look, I got some news for the high priest and his boys. The day that they wipe me out and you know, they uh, do me in will be the day that the life giver is going to pull the bread of life on all of them except the high priest. And they'll be dead cadavers there in the, in, in, in the temple. And tell the high priest this, don't call funeral directors because they don't, they don't have enough, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to the, what do you call Coffins? It? No, the, 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 the wagon. Oh, Hearses. the hearses. <laughs> hearses. I said, you better call the, the fire department of Montreal. Then you pile them all up there, the whole hundred of them. I said, this is what's going to take place. He said, he said, you're a fool. I said, you think so? Let me show you something. Picked up the Bible, and I said, I'm going to tell you a little story. Make it short, he said, short, because he says, I'm, I'm going. I said, listen to this. I just read this this morning. There's a man by the name of Hezekiah that believed in the Creator. A few hundred years back, and let me tell you, tell you what happened to him. Sennacherib came with his armies, told him the, the story. He went before the Lord and, and, and prayed about it. And the Lord says, the way that Sennacherib came, he says, that's the way he's going to go home. And during the night, 185,000 men were, were destroyed by the angel of the Lord. So I said, don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I said, I can assure you that if they put a bullet in me, they're all going to lose out. Because the, the Creator will remove your breath of life. And I felt as sure of that as if uh, I have, this was a prediction that I think the Lord would have backed up my word. So how did he respond after you told him that story? Well, he said, uh, I guess he says that I've lost my, my time. Before we part, he says, I don't want to even shake your hand because you're not a friend of mine no more. I said, have it your way. If ever we meet one another anywhere in the city of Montreal, don't you ever look at me like you know me because I'll ignore you. And embarrass you, he says, wherever we are. He says, fine. No problem with that at all. Now, Roger shared with you that his former associates that worshipped demons, that were part of that elite uh, spirit worship group in Montreal, mm -hmm. were very unhappy with him, as were the demonic mm -hmm. powers. 
for studying especially with Seventh-day Adventists. That's right. Mm -hmm. Did he ever share with you or tell you that there might be some danger involved for you? He did tell us uh, something that rather startled me. He said he got a call from somebody in that organization and uh, they threatened our lives and they knew us by name. And of course, nobody followed him. And I had to assume that the, the powers of darkness were able to c communicate to those people that worshiped what our names were. They knew our, our names. And the, the things, uh, some of the events that followed were such that I've, I attributed them to, uh, to demon powers. Cynthia, there was uh, an event mm -hmm. that was a little startling to you and to Cyril, and I know Roger was interested in it as well. You had a fire at your house shortly after the Bible studies were going on. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, shortly after the uh, Bible studies, um, we were sitting, we were living with um, my uh, father at the time. So we had a very large front room, pretty large front room. And we were sitting in the room and my brother came up who had a little problems of his own. And uh, we, they were using uh, some cleaning fluid to, to get something off of a piece of uh, clothing. And my brother suggested that um, it wouldn't burn and that he wanted to, to try it out to see if it would or wouldn't burn. And since it was a very large room, I guess he felt that uh, the fumes wouldn't be as concentrated as probably in a smaller room. So he just decided to light a match. And I guess the fumes didn't sink to the ground, but they had ri risen up to where we were sitting and the fumes burst in the room at waist, at our, at our waist, about our waist mm -hmm. as we sat down. They burst into flames? Into flames. It burst into flames. The floor was never burned at all. It was just um, as three feet off the ground, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody disappeared. And Cyril, he went downstairs to get a blanket. And my brother, he disappeared. And I was in, in further into the room um, near the window, which was on the front side of the house. And I said, well, it, it isn't going to stop, so I better do something. So I jumped up on the, the uh, chair, which turned out to be a stuffed chair, so I wasn't helping myself by any means. Then I looked at the window, which was about three feet from me, and I said, well, if I was already on the third floor, and I said, well, I'll jump from the, third, uh, in, from the window onto the balcony, which was on the second floor. It was a very small ba uh, balcony. So I looked at the, the window, and the curtains had started going up in flames. And I said, you know, I just might miss that balcony and hit the cement. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, that's not going to work. So I stayed there, and then I just became paralyzed. And uh, the only thing that was working was my mind. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't want to die. I just married a year, and my whole life is in front of me, and if you can see any way I can get out of here, please do something. And um, I waited, and I, I didn't get any answer. And pretty soon, as if somebody had hit me to knock me off the chair, the force of it, somebody said, jump now which meant no questions or any other kind of rationalizations I was giving it. And I bent down to, to, to start a sort of a broad jump. And at that side of the room, I was at least eight feet from the door. And I got down, and between me and the door was a radio, um, a floor-length radio with a lamp on it. And when I got down, when I crouched down to make the broad jump, I was outside of the room before Cyril came upstairs with the blanket. I don't remember how I got there. You were just kind of moved. It just moved. And then what happened where you had just been? <laughs> the, um, the can of gasoline apparently was, it was sitting. It wasn't gasoline, it was naphtha. Naphtha was, was uh, right by the chair, and it blew right up, a big hole into the ceiling, just as I moved away. And... Uh, 
my hair was burnt all my face was burnt and well not all right around here and my eyebrows were gone and uh, and he asked me he said how, how did you get out of the room because by this time the room was totally in flames and I said I don't know I said but I prayed and I was there he didn't need the blanket then <laughs> The Lord answers our prayers in spite of what the devil may try to do to us, doesn't to do. he? After the fire, and we moved away, and we were getting ready to come to the United States, we, of all places, moved in with an Irish family. The in, party, in a French neighborhood. In a French neighborhood. <laughs> partying. They loved to party. But we stayed to ourselves pretty much because we, we felt that we would soon be leaving the country anyway. And they turned out to be really nice people. But while we were there, we had several um, different things happen. Like, for instance, we would say our prayers and get in bed, and then the doors would start slamming, and the windows would go up, and the wind would come through the room. And it terrified us. And uh, so we went to bed every day, every night, with our Bible under our pillow. We'd turn on the light, and everything would be calm like you know as you expect and then this would happen for it happened for a, a couple of weeks and then uh, another thing started um, dishes would act like they were falling out of the closets and uh, um, somebody was sweeping with a broom on a hardwood floor and all kinds of different things and I was terrified I, I, I wouldn't stay in there um, you know at all did this happen <clears throat> Excuse me, did this happen during the Bible studies while you no, were giving No, this us? is after, afterwards. Right after this. We had a lot of things happen to us afterwards. For a couple of months. So you were harassed mm -hmm. by harassed. the demonic spirits That's right. for your role mm -hmm. in bringing Roger mm -hmm. to a knowledge mm -hmm. of biblical truth for several months. For now, several months. how did mm -hmm. it stop? The powers of darkness don't really stop. Uh, the only way you can keep them in check is on your knees, prayer. I don't think anybody is uh, immune to the problems that come about as a result of uh, the devil's work. The devil is working uh, against us full time. He knows his time is short and there's no way of saying that, oh, he, he stopped. Because when you say he stopped, that's the time he's going to start. We still have problems today that uh, we know that uh, uh, the devil is behind them. Many of the mistakes that we make, or that we think we make, have been, we, we've been set up most, in most cases. And that's why the Lord wants us to pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a time whenever you were experiencing a difficulty that you felt was the direct result of the demonic forces being angry with you? That you wished that you had never met Roger? Never. No. Never. I'd do it all over again. If, uh, if the same situation occurred, I'd be willing to do it all over again. Uh, there's no... Life is not as important as eternity. And a soul is not... Uh, cannot be uh, turned away because uh, of your own fear or your own lack of uh, courage. Uh, there will never be a time when I was, I'd be sorry. After the demon left you that Saturday night, did you have any more demon harassment over the next few months, or was it just over instantly? Mm -hmm. No, it was not over uh, instantly. Every night, the spirits knocked on the walls, knocked on the doors. I was awakened two, three times a night. By the, they were trying to uh, reopen conversation with me. The Lord would not allow them to, uh, to bother me in any ways, except that they he tried to open it to have commun communication with me and that it seems that the Lord see we the, the Creator has given us freedom of choice you can choose good or choose evil you see that's your prerogative uh, it's a freedom that he has given us which is beautiful freedom of choice well of course the enemy of the Lord says hey I want access to it at least you can allow me to knock on the door he responds you lost him. He's mine. So I knew that very well. And uh, it went for six months that the spirits knocked every night. Did you wonder why they were continuing to do that? Oh, yeah. 
I said, hey, thank you, Lord. It's all you allowed them to do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they would love to destroy me, bring the ceiling down and the whole building on me. It doesn't matter. But I said, this is good to myself. This is the thorn in the flesh. See, I had read the Second Corinthians. The Apostle Paul says, because of the abundance of the revelations that he had received from God and all that, he says, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know, because the human fallen human heart just loves to think good of itself and becomes proud and vain and uh, sin against its, its creator. And uh, the Apostle Paul says, I'm going to pray about it. He said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Three times he prayed about it. And the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Isn't that beautiful? So the Apostle said, therefore, most gladly will I rejoice in my infirmities that this, the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I said the same thing to, to the Lord. Lord, if, that's, if you want these critters to, you know, uh, be after me all the days of my life and knock and wake me up every night, that's okay with me. That's the least I could put up with, you know. So when did it stop? Well, one prayer meeting, uh, the minister says, how's things going? He says, with your Christian walk. I said, sir, couldn't go any better. He says, I'm glad for you. you know, this was after the prayer meeting, we're just leaving. And he said, uh, no problem with the spirit at all. Huh? Oh, the spirit, well, yeah, they, they, they're trying to open communication with me all the time. You knock every, uh, every night, they wake me up. You do? How can you put up with that? All right, there's no, there's no other way. Oh, no, no, he says, wait a minute. He says, it's my fault I didn't tell you this. He says, the spirits have an open avenue to you that God cannot close. As long as you have in your place the literature that you, or some of the uh, things that you had to do with spirit worship. Do you have anything like that in your place? Oh, yeah, I got three books. Then I got some incense. Then I got some candles. Well, he said, get rid of all this mess and and you're not going to be part of the spirits anymore. I'm sure of that. But I did exactly what he told me. Stop completely. See? Now today, I'm a blessing to somebody else. A lady wrote me from California. She said, it's very urgent that I get your phone number. Because I have to talk to you. I cannot write. You know? She said, I couldn't tell you everything in writing. I need to talk to you so greatly because of the fact that I have a uh, spirit oppressed, demon spirit oppressed. Well, I got the letter, and immediately, oh, she told me, yes, she gave me her phone number, and she said, if you could call me, I'll call you right back. And, and because the, of the, she has an answering machine, she's a widow, so she doesn't answer the phone. She always let the machine answer, you know, first before she called anybody back. So I called her up, and she told me what she was up against. She said, you got to help me. Like she says, you got to help me. You know what I mean? It was, she said, nobody else can. It wasn't a question, it was a no, plea. No. Yeah, yeah. She said, you got to help me, Brother Mono. The ministers can't help me over here. And even the president of our conference think I'm crazy. Isn't that sad? Well, I said, uh, exactly what's the problem? And he, she told me, I'm reading my Bible. And she said, the spirit picked up the Bible and threw it against the wall, like across the room. And when I read your book, I said, this is it. That's the same uh, thing. She told me about being bounced up on her bed, three o'clock in the morning, you know, from the ceiling down to the bed, thrown on the bed. And uh, how things move around the house, and the, she hears uh, a man's voice downstairs, and she goes down there, there's nobody. And then she said, the doors open and shut. I go back and check things, everything is locked. The windows opened by themselves and shut. So what did you tell her? I told her, lady, I said, you're being demon spirit oppressed. What can we do about it? The ministers, my minister says, won't even talk to me anymore about anything. He says, hi, sister, how have you been today? And he tries to talk to somebody else as soon as possible so that I, I don't have to tell him that in the past week I had some problem. Well, I said, lady, with God's blessing, 
you got your problem solved. And I, I gave her the recipe. And what's the recipe? I said, now you're going to have to do something very special. Okay? I'll do anything that you tell me to do that is in accordance with the will of the Lord. I said, you're going to have to acquaint yourself with the power of the blood of Christ, the redeeming power of the blood of Christ, and what he can do for you that you can do for yourself. Besides saving you for eternity, he can redeem you from, from this oppression. First, I said, before we go into this, tell me, have you ever had anybody in, in the last few years, because she said it came back, it started a few years back, about 10 years ago, and every two or three years she had this kind of an experience, but it didn't last very long. So I told her, what you have, sister, you have a taint of demon spirit defilement. Demon spirits have, have got direct access to you. And the Lord can, uh, cannot really help you there because you have in your home something that belongs to someone that is involved with the spirits of the dead, the supposed spirits of the dead, which are really, really demon spirits. As anyone that you know that could be involved with the spirit of the dead? She said, yes, the blind lady. I've been taking care of her the last two years, every three, three days per week. She's given me a, a scarf. She's given me a Bible. She's given me different other things. She said, do you think that that could be the, the thing? After she told me the experience with the old lady, the blind lady, that was it. She didn't want a Bible because the Bible is giving you trouble now. She prays, with, uh, she prays to her mother and she converses with her mother. You see, the dead mother. The, the blind lady. The blind lady. And she says, that Bible is giving you trouble. She says, would you like a Bible? So the lady says, well, I've got one already. She says, I'm going to get it with somebody. Why don't you take it? So she had taken the Bible. When she brought the Bible home, that was the beginning of the whole thing. Now, yeah. now the spirits were really moving in. And then she gave her a scarf and gave her other things like that. I said, and now so you told her to get rid of that. That's stuff. right. Now it's 10 o'clock at night when I'm, because she, she called me back because she was not home. She'd gone to visit her sister 30 miles away and she came back. And, and we're talking about 10 o'clock at night. I said, you want some peace tonight? She says, yes. Take everything, put it in the garage. Then sit yourself down with your Bible and read Matthew, the 27th chapter, the crucifixion of Christ, uh, very attentively and prayerfully and respectfully. You're going to read those 30 verses from verse 24 through 54. And I said, then you tell, talk to the Lord about it and your problems are over. And sure enough, she called me back uh, the next day. I was on a Saturday night. She, uh, she called me first. Called back. No problem at all. No noise. Nothing. She's gone. And has not returned. Except once. She phoned me up. She says, there's a problem. Yes? Yes, I, I hear the, 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 the walking again. How you do? Have you given away everything I told you that, that you had gotten from, from uh, this person? Yeah. But she says, I've been thinking about this. There's a man, she says, that uh, dated me, you know, her husband died, right? And uh, a couple of years later, uh, somebody in introduced her to this man. And uh, they went out for a few months together, and then she decided uh, that he would never become an Adventist because of the fact that he believed in the spirits of the dead so much, you know, and especially of his cousin, to talk about his cousin all the time. And he had given her a lawnmower. I said, you got a lawnmower in the place? He says, yeah. Get rid of the lawnmower. Take the lawnmower and put it outside of your garage. Don't have it on your property. She called me back and said, everything is fine. You, you, you mean to tell me now, Roger, that if someone who is a spiritist mm -hmm. or is involved in any form of spiritualism yeah. gives something to someone mm -hmm. that they have in their home, mm -hmm. that that gives the spirits the right? An avenue, open avenue. Yeah. Now, a lot of people are uh, afraid that people are going to put an X on them. Because if they take a piece of your hair or, or something that belongs to you, you put an X on you, that, that's baloney. The Lord takes care of all this nonsense. But when a spiritist or somebody that is involved with demon spirits in some form or other gives you anything and you bring it to your home, the, the spirits have got access to your home openly at all times. And the Lord cannot help you. I'm sorry to see it. He cannot help you until you voluntarily remove those things. That is correct. Yeah. But that does not mean that he doesn't hold them in check because they oh, yeah. would love Judge, to destroy, destroy them. Yeah. 
<clears throat> I've come across a lot of people that have been writing to me, and they said they've been they've had demon spirits cast out of them by one of those deliverance ministries. And I have one lady that it's been ten years now since she had demon spirits uh, casted out of them, uh, out of her. It took thirteen hours and they, they praying and talking to the spirits to get the spirits out of her. She said it was like a couple of hundred spirits you see in her and all that. And this person's spirit has been destroyed completely. Completely destroyed. Now there are two different, I want to bring this to your attention, there are two different types of, of, of people who exercise demons. You mean exercise, exercise that's you know, casting demons casting out? Casting demons, uh, spirits out of people. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you have that in the African religions. And then you have it in Christianity today, where people say, if you are fearful of this and fearful of that, you have a demon of fear in you. So what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to cast out the demon for you. And when these people listen to a sermon from one of these people, these pastors... And there are actually preachers involved in these deliverance Oh, yes, ministries. definitely. That's, what, that's what's so sad about it. What happens is they, they put on a, <coughs> a sermon in that church, talking about the fact that many of you are undoubtedly demon-possessed. You don't know it. Is it possible to be possessed by a demon and not know it? Well, no. Not if you're a Christian. If you are uh, yielding your life to Christ every day, day after day after day, you don't have to worry about demon spirits getting into your life. See? Now what happened is this. The speaker talks about the fact that he has delivered people from demon spirits. There was a hundred spirits that came out. It took ten hours of praying and of, of wrestling with the spirits to get them out of there. Now by the time that he's done with his sermon, a lot of the people that have different problems for instance, one preacher says, if you have this certain type of allergy, this certain allergy, you're demon possessed. While this poor s sister says, she believed that she was demon possessed. And she said, now, if Jesus could not keep me from being demon possessed, what kind of a God is he in the back of her mind? Thinks about it. So in reality, what you're saying is that these these supposed deliverance ministries mm -hmm. that are that are dealing directly with the occult and casting demons out of people are not are dangerous. Yeah, and dangerous. In Matthew the seventh chapter, the Lord says, "Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In your name have cast out devils. In your name done many wonderful works or miracles." And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now this is, this is a, a strong message that he's giving to somebody, some preacher. Well, it's a, it's, it's a tremendous destruction of Christianity that these ministries are doing. They're doing a great disservice to Christ. What specifically is the problem with a deliverance ministry? A person that is involved in this type of ministry, where they communicate with the spirits, or with they them. Talk, they talk with the spirits and Start ask the them spirits. their names. Yeah, yeah. They have lost thought completely on Christ. The blood of the atonement has washed away from them. They think they're doing the work of Christ, and they're doing the work of the devil. Because they're tearing people's faith down in, in Christ. There's one lady that's been calling me every week now, every uh, year Friday night, uh, and she's a, a commitment giving person. Or on Sunday, calls me for a year for a year and a half. As soon as my book on prayer came out, she's had demons cast out of her and all that. That person's fate is so low that uh, I wonder why, how she's able to keep keep alive, keep believing in Christ. She called me here at eleven thirty at night, Christmas Eve. That's Christmas. I answered the phone. She said, Barimono, I got to talk to you. I'm sorry to have called you so late. And she cries, and she cries. And I said, Lady, what is the problem? And she, she finally was able to, to uh, uh, you know, stop crying. And then she told me, I was just washing the dishes a while ago, and a man's hand was placed on my left shoulder, 
I quickly turn around, there's nobody there. So she says, the same spirit that has been trying to see the wheels off my car and driving down the road. See, She had that experience also, the wheels were coming loose. She pulled in the service station, says, something wrong with my car. The guy says, well, yes, you look at that, the nuts are, have, have gone on your front wheel. So he tightens the nut, she gets back in the car, tightens the nuts, I should say, there's five of them, drive down another mile, and the same thing happens to do the same on the back. She stopped at a service station, and the guy says, yeah, look, he says, uh, you're, the nuts are coming off the wheel. And this is a lady who had had All these hundreds de of devils yeah. cast out of her ten years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she said, <clears throat> what am I going to do? I said, you're going to do what you need to do. Fortify yourself in the merits of the blood of Christ. And then I have to rebuild her confidence in the power of the Creator. You see? Talk to her about Colossians. About the creative power of Christ. That we are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and powers. You see? He's created them all. So anyway, that this lady, she told me, she said, would you mind if I call you every week? Because it seems that when I talk with you, I regain faith in the merits of the blood of Christ, enough to be able to sustain myself for a week. But then she says, if I don't call you, by the middle of the week, she says, I'm ready, I'm in, I'm ready she says, to die. You know? She's a person of responsibility. I won't say where she works, she works for the federal government. <laughs> And she's in a high position, highly paid person, and, and uh, uh, super educated, and, and a beautiful person, you know, and, and beautiful intellect. But uh, the person, she says, I'll never recover from this thing. I said, yes, sir, sister, you will rec recover from this. Don't you worry. What did you recommend to her? Well, it would be, be uh, quite lengthy to go in, in, into it, because she has such a bad case of everything. See? But you just have a few of these really hardcore cases that you work with very yeah. carefully. Mm -hmm. But some of them are... Um, wrecks after having gone through oh, these yeah. deliverance ministries. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing. Yeah. Because once they've been told by a preacher, if they were told by the, the grocery uh, manager down, down the supermarket that they were demon-possessed because they have such an affliction, it wouldn't, it wouldn't destroy the faith in Christ. But when, when a man that says, I'm a minister of the gospel, s uh, stands in that pulpit, and he says, if you have these certain fears or whatever it is, you are undoubtedly possessed by a demon. Now, the first thing that hits the mind is that what kind of a savior do I have that couldn't keep me from becoming demon-possessed? The power of suggestion, we are told, is the greatest force on earth known to man. Mm -hmm. Alexander the Great, that conquered the world, he used the power of suggestion. He didn't want to use his armies. He said, I, I used the armies as the last resort. I used the power of suggestion, he says. So he had his, they would camp themselves around the city, and they would have speakers that would go and speak every morning and evening to the people that were in the city, telling them to, to, to give up. You're not going to come out of this alive. And by tearing down the mind to the fact, to the possibility that they will survive, then negative thoughts come in, and the people said, let's give in. He's going to have us anyway. And he, he, history tells us that he won the world not by the sword, but by the words that he spake, or that his people spake for him. So the power of suggestion is the greatest force on earth known to man that's been established by well, uh, knowledgeable people. And when a minister of the gospel stands up in the pulpit and he says to the people that even though you're a Christian, you can be demon possessed. And you undoubtedly are. He destroys faith in the merits of the blood of Christ completely. When that faith goes down to a zero figure, you know what can take place then? Demon spirit can come right in, an avenue to the soul, man. And they camp home and they said, well, we, got, we got it. So the preacher says, now at 7 o'clock tonight, we're going to meet here and have, and have a, a service. Get these, these demons out. Get yourself prepared to maybe stay all night and pray all night for these demons. You see, one person, there's a number of people that called me and told me about these things. And people that have, like mothers that have had daughters that had, uh, you know what I mean? Demons and all that, uh, possessing them. Sad to see. A lot of them killed themselves. A lot of them killed themselves. And uh, they, the, the preacher will get there and they're going to start praying over this person. 
demon possessed. And talk with the demon and find out the name of the demon and find out where, where the demon has been doing for centuries. And they get all kinds of really interesting insights on the supernatural. The spirits love it. The spirits love it. And they come out when they feel like it. What's in their interest to keep right on talking with the preacher and say, I'm not going to go out. You know? And then another voice comes out and says, well, I'm Christine, you know, and another personality of hers and another demon and all that. And, it's all demon games, is what you're demon saying. Demon games, yeah. And by the time that the, 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 the spirits are all out, the person is almost dead. Roger, there have been several people who have contacted you with special problems. And you have developed a seven-point plan to help someone who is either has messed with the occult, or is involved in the occult, or is mm. being harassed. Would you share with us just the high points of that seven-point plan? Sure. I've had a number of people that have written me or phoned and uh, were highly distressed because of the fact that, you know, they were harassed by demon spirits and they couldn't understand why. <clears throat> now, on page 534 of the Greek Controversy, there is a two-line statement here that I'd like to bring your attention. Satan is seeking to overcome men today as he overcame our first parents by shaking their confidence in their creator. Interesting, isn't it? Now, as I mentioned before, earlier, once a religious leader stands in the pulpit and convinces people that they are demon possessed, and their fate goes down to a zero figure. Demon spirits move in then, for, for real. And they exercise these people, and these spirits, I should say, and etc. But then, um, I came up with a plan that people can really get some help and get it quick. <clears throat> now here's, I have written down here. here. Here is a seven step recovery program for those who are oppressed by demon spirit and who have been victimized through so-called Deliverance ministries. You're not really deliverance, <clears throat> they involve you more in that which is destroying your Christian experience or will separate you from God. Point number one, throw out or destroy all literature that one has on deliverance ministries. Get rid of everything that they've given you. Demon spirits have a right to stay with all objects that bear the taint of their defilement. So it's not just items that relate to the occult they should get rid of, which they should get rid of, mm -hmm. but also anything that has to do with the deliverance ministry. That's right. Okay. Do not speak to demon spirits, even if it is to command them to depart in the name of the Lord Jesus. Like I have done it before I was knowledgeable of the Word of God. Let me just understand that. That if a person is confronted, they should not even command a demon spirit to leave in the name of Jesus Christ, not even right. talk to them. What should they do? When, uh, let me bring something to your attention. When Jesus, a number of times in the Bible, we read that Jesus casted out demon spirits out of people. In this one instance, for instance, the spirits wanted to, to, to they started to talk, that he was a son of God. And Jesus forbid them to talk, because they are lying spirits. They'll say, uh, three or four words of truth and ten of lies. And you put uh, it all together and people feel, you know, you talk about the Lord Jesus so nicely, you've got to be of the Lord, you see. And it's not so in, in the world of uh, uh, spiritual conflict. If a person is in a situation where demonic power is evident, mm -hmm. they are not to even command that spirit to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. What, how are they to get rid of them? Do they kneel down and pray? Do no. they let the Holy Spirit do it? Yes. What do they do? You do it, they, you do it by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, Jesus told the Jews that he casted out demons through the power of the Holy Spirit. He informed them on that. And the Apostle Paul, we read in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, went to Ephesus, and Ephesus was a, a, a cult area of all kinds of, of uh, um, occultism of the uh, demon spirit involvement. It was a great center uh, of occultism for, in the Roman Empire. And there he, re retained, he remained there for two years. 
and with 12 of, of his uh, followers that he met there, uh, they prayed for the, these uh, Ephesians. They were pagans, they were, you know, there was no Christians living there at all. And we are told that he did a tremendous work, or I should say better than that, the Holy Spirit did a tremendous work in, as a result of their prayers. And the Spirit of God rested upon Paul so much that people would even come to him and, and with handkerchiefs and with aprons, it says. And the Bible says, and I quote verses 11 and 12, says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons. And the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits left them. Or, or, you know. So the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, is what does the cleansing and the regaining rid of the demons. You don't even have to mention, get out in the name of Jesus. And all that. It's, a, it's a fallacy. I'll tell you why. It's dangerous. That's what it is. Because the spirits will re reply to you uh, most of the time. And you get involved with them, and you're, you're a loser. Because you become tainted. So immediately then, if you are confronted yeah. with a demonic power, mm -hmm. the thing you would do is pray and ask the power of the Holy Spirit to remove that demonic force. That's the correct oh, yeah. procedure. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I've, I've dealt with people that were demon-possessed. No question about it. In my business of, of the Yellow Page Advertising, certain persons that nobody wanted to handle the account. This, this guy is weird. One guy says, I think he's demon-possessed. He was a Baptist. He said, I think this guy is demon-possessed. I will never handle this account again. Yeah. I go in there and the guy is, is blaspheming and hitting the, the desk with his fist and he's talking to somebody over the phone, telling them to go somewhere in a real big hurry. And I just start praying for the Holy Spirit of God through the medicine of the blood of Christ shed on Calvary to do the work which Jesus said he, he would do. And by asking for the blood of Christ to be appropriated to this man, and that his sins be forgiven him. He probably has not his sins in 20 years. He has no desire to. But he's entitled to the freedom and the deliverance that Christ gives to us through his shedding of his precious blood. And I have seen people just like a big balloon that you put a, a pin into. Whew. The pressure is gone. The guy smiles. <laughs> he hasn't smiled in a month. You know? One guy says, hey man, he says, you know something? You've been here 10 minutes and it's the only 10 minutes I've had of rest in the last week. He says, what are you, well, why are you anyway? <laughs> you know, he says, you've got a special power with you, man. Did you tell him it was the Spirit of God with you? I didn't tell him right there and then, but I did a little later. You mentioned two points. What's your third <clears throat> point? Go ahead and review the first okay. two. The first you one, throw away all literature and all matter of materials that has been related to these either uh, deliverance ministries, or if you're involved with occultism uh, some form of other. Don't speak to the spirits. Ignore them completely. And you just ask for the Lord, by the power of His Holy Spirit, in the medicine of the blood of Christ, to drive away the spirits. Now you say, where do you get this thing? Well, I have a lot of verses from the Bible that I could show, prove it to you from. But I want to read you a quotation from page 431 of the Desire of Ages, because okay. it puts it real the way I like to, to have it. Earnest persevering supplications to God in faith can alone avail, avail to bring men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and wicked spirits in high places. And I've proven this for 45 years. This is not due to me. This is what I've experienced over the years. See? Excellent. Yeah. Now part four, uh, uh, part three is early in the morning read about the crucifixion of Christ. It takes four minutes without having to rush through it. Matthew 27 chapter, read verses 24 through 54. It will take you from Pilate's judgment hall and bring you to Golgotha. And there you will see the, the, the Son of God expire on the cross. And that, that the earthquake took place. And even the Roman pagan says, truly this was the Son of God. See? And as you read that, you visualize it, and you're actually there oh, yeah. each morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And uh, it'll change your life. One man phoned me up. He says, I've been going to Golgotha every morning now. He says, from Pilate's Pil Pil Judgment Hall to Golgotha every morning. Like you told me last year, my life has changed. I'm not the same person. Praise the Lord. He says, I got a different 
view and understanding of the conflict between the force of good and evil, I understand more exactly what Jesus did for me. And he couldn't stop telling how, what it had done for his life. Now, you must ask God, even if it's in the middle of the afternoon, you pray ten times before that, okay? You're going to pray for about someone, or, or in a case like this, say, Lord, before I ask you for your help, I want you to make sure that if, I've, if I have offended you in thoughts, words, and deeds, that you remove the offenses by the medicine of the blood of Christ. I always, I always make sure that I have a clear, clean slate. Because the Bible tells us that the, the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And there's a lot of wickedness that can pass in our thoughts, man. Even if we don't uh, stop ourselves to look at it, you know. And you have to pray for faith and for the power of Christ to save you. Now, we're told by the pen of that faith is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it flourish only as it is cherished. I will talk to you only right now about the first part. It's inspired right. by the Holy Spirit. So if we need the faith, where do we go? We go to Christ or to the Father and we plead for this very special blessing. And it'll always be given you. Blessings that uh, are marvelous. Point seven is to memorize the Word of God in order to live a victorious, successful Christian life. And to memorize the Word of God, it automatically brings you faith, hope, joy in the Lord. And that is power. Roger, on the last book that you wrote on intercessory prayer, mm -hmm. did you experience any harassment at that time? Uh, yes, <laughs> some. So the demon spirits from 45 years ago still didn't want you talking. That's right. As I started to write the manuscript, I wasn't very gone uh, into it more than maybe while well, I'd written the first chapter of it uh, as, uh, you know, just for the kids to have something to read after if I pass away, they'll have something to know how the old man was able to pray and the Lord blessed, you know, my experience in the hospital in uh, Canada. But then, after Daniel had told me, Dad, you should write a book. And uh, I said, no, I'm, I'm no writer when it comes to prayer. There's been so many books written on prayer. So he said, why don't you just write Mr. Richard Coffin that helped you with your first book, and the Review Herald, see what he says about it. Well, Mr. Coffin wrote back and says, yes, send us the 11-page manuscript that you have. We want to look at it. And uh, then, of course, uh, the good news came that they wanted me to, to uh, submit two more chapters. And then the entire manuscript. Well, as soon as I started the second chapter, it was during the daytime, the garage door started to open. Now, this is an old garage door. This, this house, by the way, is 100 years old, a little over 100 years old. The part next to it is, is new, fairly new. But that garage door is probably 40 years old. And it's one of those rollers up and down with the big springs. And it makes a terrible noise when, when you raise it and when you lower it. And especially when you get to be, a, when you bring it down, it's about a foot from the, from the floor. If you happen to let it handle, it hits that concrete and there are the glass panes, the panes of glass rattle, you know, makes a lot of noise. And it opened two or three times. I paid no attention to that. Hilda calls me from upstairs says, uh, come down here and see who's playing at the garage door. I said, I come down. I said, everything's all right. She says, you just sit here and you watch and see. She says, this door has been opening three times she says, in the last half hour. Oh. And she said, didn't uh, Greg mow the lawn yesterday? Because I told her, maybe Greg can get the lawn mower or something. He's going to do the lawn. No, he did it yesterday, she said. Well, I got thinking right away. I can't believe it. See? I thought of the spirits right away. But uh, I said, don't worry about it. It's nothing at all. Sure enough, I was going up the staircase, I hear the thing rolling up and then rolling down. So I said, I'm going to go out there. I went out there and there was nobody around at all. So I came back in to the Hilda. It's not going to happen again. She says, what do you mean it's not going to happen again? How do you know? I, I said, I don't know. Some, there's a lot of teenagers around here. They must have opened the door and run. You see? But I knew exactly what had taken place. Because that evening, when she went to work, she worked night shift at the hospital, uh, I started to write again. When I started to write, the door started to, to roll up and down. Every 20 minutes, 25, 30 minutes, the door would roll up and down. And it would hit concrete, man, and make an awful noise. So what went through your mind? Well, I prayed about it. I said, Lord, 
<laughs> the spirits don't want me to write this, this book. But I'm not working for the spirits, I'm working for you. Okay? And I said, if you want me to tell my prayer experience, my prayer life for the last 45 years, you're going to have to help me get rid of those spirits. But it turned out that all that night, that door must have opened 50 times. Because I, I wrote until 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. So I realized I was not going to be able to write during the daytime. And the next night, same exact same thing. And it went every night that I wrote that I uh, wrote that manuscript. And I'll tell you what. I told the Lord, after the next night, he did it again. I said, Lord, it's okay. You know, this is not heaven on earth. We're in the line of the enemy. So I can't put up with that, you know, as long as my wife is not scared to death. And that's what happened. I wrote the manuscript like this. And as soon as you finish the manuscript, it stopped. I'll stop, yeah. But you know, I can understand why the devil is so angry. You are giving a snapshot mm -hmm. of a side of his work that very few people have ever had an opportunity to see and live to tell about. Mm -hmm. And Ellen White tells us that there is nothing that the devil fears more, Roger, mm -hmm. than that his methods and his devices will be discovered and people will have a natural defense against them. Mm -hmm. So I can understand exactly why he was upset. But praise the Lord, the Lord's power was stronger and yeah. continues to be stronger. The Lord has been gracious to me over the years. I've been in some situations on the road with trucks and storms and snow and sleet and things. I was traveling so much. I was traveling uh, anywhere between uh, 25 to 35,000 miles a year. And that's a lot of miles to put on the, on the road all the time. And I've seen so many instances where I could have been killed. I mean, well, as a matter of fact, in my, my book on prayer, I, I talk about two or three incidents there. Well, it occurs to me that there's an old rule that says if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. Yeah. And fortunately for you, 45 years ago, you were rescued, kind of a brand from the burning. That's right. Roger, and your testimony lives on. Yeah. You've walked into the shadow of death for... 45 years according to the priest, but if I read correctly in your book, you said you wouldn't mind that as long as the Creator walked with you. And That's he right. has, yeah. hasn't he? Mm -hmm. Definitely. You've been watching the conclusion to A Trip into the Supernatural.